Welcome everyone to the Labor, Mobility and Global Health Governance in Asia Conference, held in conjunction with the publication of the edited volume, Public Health in Asia during the COVID-19 pandemic, Global Health Governance, Migrant Labor and Interna International Health Crises, edited by Florian Schneider, Catherine Lowe and myself. Uh, this is a joint conference by the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, Latin Asia Center and the IF4, IF4 Research Center. And today we have some amazing speakers lined up. And I have the pleasure of introducing our first speakers now. First up is Dr. Florian Schneider, who is not only the director of the Light and Asia Center, so my boss, but that's only one of the reasons I'm being super nice today. Um, he's also a senior university lecturer in the politics of modern Asia at the Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. He's the managing editor of the peer-reviewed Asiascape Digital Asia Journal and the author of three books, Staging China, The Politics of Mass Spectacle, China's Digital Nationalism, and visual political communication in popular Chinese television series. He has won multiple prizes and accolades for his teaching and his scholarly work. And next we have Christita Perez, Senior Program Manager for the Regional Economic Program, Asia at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung um, Japan office. She holds the Trade, Women and Digitalization and the Future of Work in Asia portfolio and has extensive experience in CASA's Philippines office in the areas of political party building and political reforms. She finished her graduate degree in public policy at the renowned Hitotsubashi University in Japan and is currently speaking to us from Tokyo. But let me first give the floor to Florian. Hi everyone and uh, thank you very much for having me. And now I know why Anoma is so nice to me, I suppose. Uh, but no, it's, it's a real pleasure and a, an honor to be part of this discussion. I'm very happy to see this book launch. Uh, Anoma and Christina, uh, Catherine have done uh, a fantastic work uh, on this uh, volume. I'm mainly uh, along for the ride. Uh, a big uh, applause then also to uh, Anoma, who's done uh, stellar editing work, uh, which uh, for those of you who are involved with academic publishing know uh, is difficult under any circumstances, but certainly during a pandemic and uh, on a topic that is so timely and that we are trying to get to you as quickly as possible. So the book will be out in open access with Amsterdam University Press, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, you all reading it and giving us your feedback. I'm very happy to see this uh, happen so uh, quickly, which is quite rare for academic publications, which usually take two or three years before they're in people's hands. Uh, I also want to thank, uh, aside from my colleagues at the Leiden Asia Center, certainly the colleagues at uh, IFO and Osaka, uh, and the colleagues at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, in Tokyo, uh, who have been uh, absolutely essential in making us uh, put together this event for you here today and for producing this book. Uh, I, I want to briefly just mention how important it is to have works like this that are extremely timely and talk about uh, evolving situations, even though we, of course, are still uh, living through the crisis and through the pandemic. So it's uh, quite difficult to assess how these things all hang together in the, in the big picture. Uh, but it's uh, also part of our mandate at the Leiden Asia Center to produce precisely this kind of uh, academically driven but extremely timely, timely and socially relevant research uh, that is then communicated uh, clearly to a broader audience. And I think this is exactly what this book does. It has all these short, punchy uh, chapters in it uh, that look at the situation on the ground based on often years and years of research uh, on labor and health and governance, but now through the lens of this particular event uh, as it is unfolding. And I think uh, I actually just had a conversation with a colleague of mine, um, sort of a hardcore academic who felt that as academics, we were rushing after the trend too much and that we're doing too many, uh, his words, quote unquote, too fashionable uh, topics. And by that, he meant, you know, the environmental crisis and the pandemic and LGBT issues. And I honestly don't know what to say to that kind of attitude, because on the one hand, I do understand that, of course, we, we sometimes need to let things settle before we can do in-depth uh, analysis, but are we supposed to wait 10 years after the pandemic until we speak as academics to these topics? So that strikes me as a little bit odd. I think it's absolutely crucial uh, that academics and experts are part of this conversation and that they are so quickly, because otherwise uh, we're yielding the floor to folks who might not be quite so well informed, and that can be quite disastrous. Uh, so I'm very happy to see uh, the experts who are lined up here today uh, introduce us in a moment to their research, to their work, and give us a rundown of their most important findings. So uh, it's a real pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion.
So on behalf of Conrad Adenauer Stiftung and our director, Ms. Rabreya Brauer, I warmly welcome everyone to our conference. So echoing what Florian has just said, the region has dealt with contagious viral diseases in the past, but the present COVID-19 pandemic continues to have significant systemic impact. So after almost two years into the pandemic, we are slowly seeing an even easing an adjustment in both economic and social conditions all over the region. But our lived reality has exposed the vulnerabilities of our global health governance system and at the same time highlighted the need to expand and strengthen our social protection systems to timely respond to the needs of highly at risk sectors such as international migrants among others. So we organized this conference with the objective of critically looking at how global health governance and international labor migration in Asia have evolved during public health crises. Different countries have tackled COVID-19 through a diverse mixture of policy adjustments leading to changing public perceptions and fluctuations in the trust in and legitimacy of institutions. So the first panel that you will hear from today will look at how COVID-19 has changed and is shaping the future of global mobility in the region. The second set of discussions will give perspectives on the developments of global health governance ba based on both intended changes and unintended consequences of the pandemic. The conference is also a pre-launch of some sorts of the volume Public Health in Asia during the COVID-19 pandemic, edited by our partner institution, the Leiden Asia Center. So the volume is a collection of case studies comprehensively covering health policy, global health governance, international migrant labor, and national pandemic responses. So it is our hope that this conference and the upcoming publication can contribute to a deeper and, dare I say, a more nuanced understanding of the need for a multi-level approach to this very complex crisis that the entire world is, is facing. And that the learnings that we will have and will continue to have, especially those coming from this region, can serve as a strong basis to help us recover, build back better, and anticipate the next crisis to come. Again, welcome everyone to this conference and thank you for taking the, your valuable time to be with us today. Thank you both very much. And thank you, Florian, for your very kind words. Um, next, we have our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Toshia Hoshino. Um, I probably need my notes for this way too impressive CV. Um, Professor Hoshino served as ambassador and deputy permanent representative of Japan to the United Nations in New York between 2017 and 2020, right into the COVID-19 pandemic, working on social development goals. In this capacity, he has also directly worked with the United Nations organizations such as the WHO. And previous to his role at the UN, Professor Hoshino was Dean of the Osaka School of International Public Policy at Osaka University and Vice President of Osaka University. Before that, he served as Minister Counselor in charge of political affairs at the Permanent Mission of Japan to the United Nations. And at the UN, he was a principal advisor to the chair of the UN Peacebuilding Commission while Japan was its chair. Um, and if you thought that wasn't impressive enough, Professor Hoshino has also been Senior Research Fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs, a guest scholar at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University, a fellow at the Stanford Japan Center at Stanford University, a visiting fellow at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University, and a special assistant political affairs at the Embassy of Japan to the United States. Um, now that he is finally back at Osaka University as a full-time professor, he is specialized in UN peace and security policies, uh, human security and humanitarian issues, Asia Pacific security and Japan-US relations. And with that, I want to give the floor to Professor Toshia Hoshino. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nova, for your kind and generous uh, introduction. Uh, it is my real pleasure to be a part of this webinar with the inspiring topic, uh, labor mobility and uh, global health governance in Asia, um, which is accompanied by the timely publication of uh, a seminar work, I think, 
on the public health in Asia during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I have uh, uh, prepared some uh, uh, slides uh, so that my the organizer uh, can help uh, show those uh, slides alongside of my uh, presentation. Uh, but I sincerely hope this uh, book as well as this webinar and my talk will stimulate the discussion on how best uh, we can overcome the current pandemic as well as preparing ourselves to any future health-related crisis, including the outbreak of infectious diseases of transporter nature. Um, the pandemic, the term represents, impacted on the entire world. But I believe it is useful to focus our attention to Asia, our a part of the, the world. Um, there are uh, two maps I uh, forecast, uh, uh, no, I, I showed today in the outset, but uh, do you think that the organizer can uh, show my uh, slides? Adam? If not, um, I can go on. Um, but uh, the, 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 the map I wanted to show you is uh, the number of, uh, uh, about the number and the geographical distribution of infection and death by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And there from the Nikkei, if you look at the Nikkei website, you can uh, see the updated uh, map of, of uh, the infection situation and death every day. And of course, uh, uh, how we uh, define Asia uh, is very, uh, you know, it depends on uh, uh, the, how we view the Asia. But as far as Asia is, uh, uh, but if I define it uh, in narrowly and look at the East Asia, the level of impact is relatively smaller than Europe and Americas. China, where the virus is, consider, uh, is uh, considered originated, has significantly uh, control the infection, as you know. The government is so serious about it from the very beginning, and now with the Winter Olympic Games in sight, it redou redoubled its efforts to contain and prevent the spread. And um, if you include South Asia and West Asia, uh, there are uh, countries like India, Iran, and Turkey, uh, which experience a serious challenge. The next page, you can show, you see the, uh, uh, the map of the infection. And then another slide shows the death of the, uh, the situation uh, of the COVID-19. So this is how we see the uh, situation as of uh, this week uh, in the world. And Africa, uh, due to their lack of health infrastructure, uh, we need to pay more attention to the region. But in general, uh, we see the fact that the United States and Europe, particularly countries like uh, UK, France, Spain, Italy, and Russia too, if we include it uh, in Russia, uh, in Europe, has many patients, so many patients. Permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations who are supposed to be very powerful in the entire world uh, were the ones most vulnerable, uh, ironically suffering from the most and the, um, suffering the most and have the difficulty managing the plague. Japan's performance is by no means perfect, uh, but the countries and the economies in Asia, including South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, if you have a better regional arrangement, we could have responded to this challenge much more effectively, I think. So this sort of regional approach proves to be important as it follows the pattern of labor mobility in the region and the labor mobility is a foundation of our prosperity in this region. So this can be a lesson from the ongoing COVID, COVID uh, crisis, I think. In addition to this, another lesson to be learned from the current pandemic is that the COVID pandemic is no doubt a public health uh, crisis but it is also important to define it as a broader human security crisis. 
Uh, please look at the next slide if the organizer can move to the next slide. Um, the human security here is defined as the strategies and policies uh, to protect the vital core of all human lives in ways that enhance human freedoms and uh, human fulfillment, meaning that they are the uh, policy measures to protect and empower people by creating political, social, environmental, and economics, military, and cultural systems uh, that together give people the building blocks for survival, livelihood, and dignity. When COVID hit the United States, I was in Manhattan, New York, as Noma said. Yes, I was an ambassador in charge of uh, uh, UN affairs, and um, they could, uh, the New York Manhattan was the epicenter of the, uh, uh, you know, of this COVID-19 at that time, and um, the city was quickly locked down, and the UN was closed too. And I found socioeconomic impact of the COVID to all the spectrum of human lives, uh, their people's survival, not just survival, but the livelihood and dignity beyond its health concerns. Um, people lost their lives by the virus, of course, but many people lost their jobs and many businesses closed. Many of them became bankrupt. And the Black Lives Matter if you, movement, if you recall, emerged out of social and racial privileges. This represented a classic model of human security crisis, I thought, and a more comprehensive approach uh, approaches beyond uh, medical uh, services became necessary. It is therefore important to go beyond the traditional policy silos to, to help people, particularly in highly vulnerable situations, by combining medical measures and socioeconomic measures, and even justice center-related uh, uh, policy actions, by combining also the local and global efforts to leave no one behind. Over-politicization of the issue have made the response uh, to the pa uh, pandemic very complex, as you can see. We can move to the next slide, which is going to the la my last slide. I proposed a comprehensive human security approach to COVID, but it was easily compromised by the political developments in many countries. As you can see uh, in the next slide, we'll show you that the autocratic and the authoritarian countries tended to have had an upper hand in controlling the spread of virus by easily controlling the people's mobility and privacy. No democratic country has this option. Um, Self-centered Bakhtin nationalism spread in many parts of the world when the global solidarity is required the most. And political rivalries among major powers such as between the US and China, significantly delay the collaborative works in the United Nations. It took amazingly more than three months to pass a single resolution because of the US frustration of China's uh, influence to the uh, WHO, for instance. Even the people of Japan, who are usually very open and kind to the work of the UN, lost their trust to the work of the UN, including the Security Council on one side and the WHO on the other because of the lack of uh, effectiveness of those uh, institutions. Time is now to collaborate, to leave no one behind. And as far as the COVID pandemic is concerned, no one can be safe until everyone is safe from infection in this interconnected world. In this context, I still consider that the non-political human security approach to COVID pandemic is relevant and useful. And uh, this idea of human security should be a founding principle of uh, global health governance that we are talking today. Uh, in this connection, I'd like to draw your attention to another concept, which is the concept of uh, UHC, universal health coverage. This is an idea that Japan originally put forward in international arena and now getting uh, more acceptance in the world. Achieving USC, UHC is uh, now incorporated in the SDG 3.8. And the December 12, for instance, is now designated as the Universal Health Coverage Day. UHC 
here demonstrates the idea that everyone everywhere should have access to quality, affordable healthcare. It originated uh, from Japan's own effort to provide uh, universal health coverage to the people in Japan as early as 1960. It is only 15 years after the devastation of war, and even within the within the enormous budget const, uh, constraints. But the government accepted, adopted this policy, believing that public health as well as education of the people would be the foundation of national wealth and growth. Achieving UHC goals in global scale is certainly a, a most ambitious goal to pursue, but it is worth trying. And I consider UHC uh, most relevant and attractive a concept as we uh, look at the public health of cross-border uh, migrant workers as it is necessary to explore the quality and affordable access uh, to healthcare whenever and wherever uh, those uh, migrant workers are. Um, so um, um, the concept of UHC, uh, UHC um, um, is very relevant uh, in this uh, context, I think. Um, and um, so uh, the concept of UHC uh, should cover uh, the uh, also, uh, um, also should involve the concept of resilience. As you know, that the resilience is often discussed uh, in the context of disaster uh, management. But I think uh, a disaster, uh, you know, the re resilience concept can be uh, applied in this uh, 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 health context as well, including uh, preventing, preparing, and responding to the public health challenges. So uh, expanding the notion of uh, resilience building to public health domain um, and promote international cooperation is going to be the important steps we are going to uh, make. Um, uh, and uh, where to start then, if you consider this is a very useful approach. Uh, while our eventual ambition should be uh, global and universal, but Asia, I think, is a good region to start. Asia is a region of diversity, as you know, um, but it is a region of full dynamism, uh, backed by the mobility of people, including this uh, cross-border migrant workers. So if we are successfully building resilience of workers, particularly in the area of public health, under the notion of universal health coverage, where people can get uh, affordable and access uh, quality health wherever and when, whenever they are, it is going to be a significant step forward to achieve a, a global health governance. And it, is, uh, it will help build a critical foundation uh, of the uh, future prosperity of this dynamic uh, region of Asia. So with this uh, prospect uh, in our regional outlook in mind, I'd like to co conclude my uh, talk today and uh, wish each one of you the very lively discussion and uh, importance uh, on this important subject matter of uh, labor mobility and global health governance in Asia. So thank you very much for your kind uh, into, uh, kind attention. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much for that excellent keynote speech, Professor Hoshino. Now let me perfectly segue this into the introducing the next panel. Um, it is a personal pleasure for me to be able to introduce the moderator of uh, today's first panel titled COVID-19 and the Future of Labor Mobility and Health in Asia. Shurt and Das will be a familiar face for everyone tuning in from the Netherlands, as he is currently the China and Greater East Asia correspondent for Dutch national public broadcaster, NOS, based in Beijing right now. In this function, he covers China, Japan, North Korea, and South Korea. And despite the increasingly difficult media environment in China, the increasing pressure on foreign journalists in the world, evidenced by one of our Dutch correspondents in Russia being ousted from the country uh, just yesterday, um, and as a testament to his dedication to the Chinese language, I feel, 
um, he has been able to provide the Dutch public with a nuanced perspective on contemporary China, an impressive feat in itself. But even before his work for the NOS, he gained extensive media experience working at RTL News, RTLZ, and Financial Dagblad, the Dutch Financial Daily. And with that, I would like to give the floor to Sjoerd. Uh, best field, uh, I hope you can hear me uh, and that the connection is good enough. I'm not going to win the prize here today, I think, for the best field uh, bookshelf. I'm talking to, to all of you uh, from our very small office in uh, the city center of uh, Beijing. This is where we uh, mostly do our uh, radio hits, um, our voiceovers for TV, etc. Um, I still remember uh, uh, two years ago, almost uh, late December, early January, when these first uh, messages popped up uh, on Weibo, uh, Chinese Twitter, so to say, uh, also through the press agencies that there was this unknown uh, pneumonia in Wuhan. Uh, it was the time that we just got back from a few months of very extensive and tiring reporting in Hong Kong. So I was like, we hear more often about potentially infectious diseases um, in China, and usually after a couple of days, um, that goes away. So I did go on a holiday, and that was uh, a very wrong uh, decision. Uh, it was the shortest holiday, I think, ever, because I flew back uh, from Thailand a couple of days later. Uh, and here we are two days, uh, two, two years later, uh, still talking about COVID, uh, talking about um, all the uh, consequences on people's lives all over the world. And this virus was not going to go away soon, um, is what we knew when we started to talk to the people in Wuhan and heard about uh, their stories uh, from the hospital, so to say. Um, fast forward right now, um, here we are, in my case, um, in China, uh, which is pretty tough to get into. Uh, there have been uh, limitations uh, for a long time. They have fortunately been lifted before the summer for journalists uh, to enter the country. Uh, for business people, it was slightly easier. Uh, but all of you know that uh, China still has one of the strictest uh, policies uh, when it comes to entering the country. I think North Korea uh, is the only one that does stricter quarantines um, if they let people in at all uh, than China. And that's not going to go away anytime uh, soon. Um, which is a huge cost, uh, obviously. Um, fortunately, I'm covered by a good uh, emperor uh, who has let me uh, to leave the country last summer for the um, Olympics, where I could enjoy at least my Tokyo hotel room and some of the venues. Um, many people obviously don't have uh, this luxury to be able to pay airfares that are three, four thousand euros now for a single trip to China to pay for three weeks of uh, centralized quarantine. Uh, I just came back from Guangzhou yesterday in the south of China that used to be uh, a place um, also called um, Africa Town. Many African traders that would stay there for shorter or longer periods of time. Uh, it's empty now. Many of these people have left the place and have not been able uh, to come back. Uh, just one example of, of the uh, issues uh, popping up here, and I won't go uh, too much into depth about that, um, because we have a very uh, impressive list of speakers, I think, during uh, this panel. They're going to take us uh, in, on a deep dive uh, in the next hour or so uh, with perspectives from their countries. Uh, their regions, uh, what the effects are also on uh, uh, migrant workers, for instance, trying to enter their respective countries. Um, so one like, I want to introduce the speakers to you. Um, the first one is uh, Peja Lan. She's a distinguished professor uh, from the Department of Sociology, director also of the Global Asia Research Center at the National uh, Taiwan University. She published extensively uh, on, on sociological issues, on migration, uh, migrant domestics, and newly rich employers in Taiwan is, is one of her uh, big publications. Um, second speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Gabriele Vogt. Um, professor for Japanology, uh, director of the Asia Studies uh, Department at the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. Um, she lived uh, and worked in Japan for many, many years. Um, her research focusing uh, on 
contemporary uh, structures of uh, governments, uh, citizens, uh, political participation. If I have to finish the whole CV, I think we, we need another hour. Uh, very impressive. Uh, a lot of uh, research, a lot of publication about healthcare giver migration. Uh, we'll hear, hear from her uh, uh, from Japan. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Shabari Nair, uh, labor migration specialist um, for South Asia. He is based in New Delhi um, with the uh, International Labor Organization, part of the Decent Work uh, Technical Support Team there. Um, he provides uh, uh, technical advisory services uh, to countries there in the region, uh, including India, including Afghanistan, uh, Bangladesh, uh, the Maldives, which could be on my list of next holiday destinations once all lockdowns are lifted. Um, give them a round of virtual applause. I would almost uh, after uh, their introductory statements. Um, there is room for questions from the audience. Uh, but first, I would like to go from Beijing to Taiwan, cross the strait, uh, and give the floor to Dr. Uh, Paige Nala. Thank you very much for the invitation and introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to join the discussion today. So let me try to share my screen. Okay. Is it working? Can you see my slide? Um, not yet. Um, today, I'd like no, to use my 10 minutes okay. to talk about um, migrant workers' immobility and mobilities under Taiwan's border control for COVID-19. Uh, can you see the slide now? If not, it's okay. No, I can still not see. Okay, that's fine. Forget it. <laughs> you can just see me. Oh, okay. Hold on. Is it working now? Is it working now? No, unfortunately not. There, something is okay. popping up. There we go. All right. Excellent. Okay. So, um, as we know that uh, the pandemic has severely disrupted global travel and the transnational movement. That's why we are all sitting here. Um, Taiwan, an island country that employs more than 700,000 migrant workers, has closed its border to most foreigners. So in 2020, Taiwan kept a record of more than 200 days with zero cases and a total of seven deaths. It successfully contained the virus until May 2021, when the government imposed a three-month level three COVID alert. So Taiwan offers an ideal case for us to examine how border control impacts migrant workers. The two time period before and during level three alert offer contrasting contexts regarding migrant workers' mobility and immobility. So let me start with the, uh, the first period. So the de facto border closure happens because the migration infrastructure was disrupted in both receiving and sending country. In Taiwan, foreigners are barred from entering with some exception, such as diplomat foreign students, business traveler, and those holding valid resident certificates. Although migrant workers with job permits were allowed to enter before the level three alert, some were unable to acquire visa from Taiwan's embassies or their own governments because the offices were shut down during the lockdown. The sending government may also close the border or constrain the out migration of their citizen. For instance, the Philippine government prohibited their national from going to greater China, which includes Taiwan, after the bulk outbreak in China in February 2020. In addition, many airline companies cancel or reduce flights. International travelers have to spend twice more money to transfer via longer routes. Even for those who manage to acquire the necessary document, they have to endure a mandatory 14-day quarantine. 
So as a result, aspiring migrants are trapped in a condition of involuntary immobility, as you can see the figure here. And this is just some photo to show you that in some cases, they were quarantined as a group, which actually exposed them to higher health risk. So just a quick heads up, by the way, we can't see your uh, PowerPoint at the moment. Okay, you know what? That's fine. Well, just, uh, you can just okay. see me. <laughs> so the decline of migrant labor supply becomes more critical because, because, sorry, become more critical because COVID has increased labor demand in some sectors in Taiwan. In particular, the semiconductor and related industries face a market boom thanks to the rising global demand for computer chips and other tech products during the pandemic. Hungry for labor, these factories are now willing to hire migrants without relevant work experience or skill. Younger, higher educated, or English speaking Filipinos have more advantage. Uh, so uh, maybe you can move the slides. The media has reported about the increase of labor market mobility with sensational titles such as the flight of foreign maids. Uh, please move the flies, probably two more. One more, yes. Um, it is a uh, previous one, thank you. It is not surprising that many migrant care workers are eager to transfer to factories because factory jobs are covered by the labor standard law and minimum wage protection. By contrast, migrant care workers suffer from longer hours, low pay, and they lack peer support in a living condition. During the pandemic, migrant care workers who are already in Taiwan gain increasing bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis their employers and brokers. Uh, next one, please. In fact, the number who successfully transfer across sectors is still limited. The other developed a variety of strategy to improve their working condition. Some maneuver the exit option, including legal transfer or running away from their employer to bargain for a raise. Okay, so let me move on to talk about the second period. Next, time, next slide, please. So, um, however, a sharp surge happened in metropolitan Taipei around late April 2000, uh, 2021. Taiwan CDC raised a nationwide level three alert for three months. During this period, people were not requi were required to wear masks at all time. Indoor gathering, more than five were not allowed. And outdoor gathering were limited to 10 people. The schools were shut down. Working from home was encouraged, but not required. Migrant factory workers became the center of the spotlight during the outbreak. A few cluster infections broke out at four electronic factory in Miali County, where migrant workers live in the same dormitory block. Next one, please. The biggest plant among them is KYEC, a semiconductor company. Among 7,000 employees, including 2,000 migrants, there were more than 300 confirmed cases and 85% of them were migrant workers. Despite the cluster infection, the factory did not stop the production until it was forced by the CDC to do so, and it lasted for 11 days. The suspension of production would lead to enormous pressure from their international buyers, as migrant workers are the essential labor force in the global supply chain. Next one. On June 7th, the Miaoli County government announced a ban for migrant workers in the area from leaving their factory and dormitories. Since Taiwan was not under a full lockdown during this time, human rights organizations criticized this restriction of movement as an act of discrimination against migrant workers. The county mayor, Xu Yaochang, pushed back at the accusation saying, quote, 
You can talk about human rights when you are dead, unquote. This measure lasted 20 days, impacting more than 6,000 migrant workers. Actually, the restriction on migrant workers' movement take different forms across factory. Some were prohibited from going out at all, except for taking the company shuttle to work. Some were given two free hours maximum per day. Some were only restricted from traveling to other cities or provinces. Some were prohibited from staying outside overnight. But these measures were all migrant specific, not applied to local workers. This measure built up an internal border that divides self-governing Taiwanese citizens and migrant workers who are perceived as potential carriers of disease and better be isolated or kept some distance from. And the duty of guarding the internal border were outsourced to private agents, including employers and brokers. However, the migrant community outside the imaginary border was not subjected to sufficient care for epidemic prevention. As you can see uh, the photo here, because most dormitory are so crowded, it was impossible for migrants to keep proper social distance. Some KYEC migrants who were quarantined in dormitory turned temporary shelter, complained that the process of moving was chaotic and living condition was crowded and, and sometimes unsanitary. In addition to the restriction of physical movement, migrant workers were deprived of labor market mobility during a level three alert. Next one, please. On June 6, the Ministry of Labor placed a temporary ban on practical all transfer of migrant workers among employers. And employers are also temporarily banned from moving migrant workers among their factories. After the level three alert was lifted, the Ministry of Labor announced a new rule. A migrant workers who wants to change job now has to register at the government run employment service center, which will then advertise a worker to household employers for 14 days. Only if no employers express interest in hiring her could she transfer to other jobs. And as there is a significant labor shortage in the caregiving sector, it is practically impossible for migrant caregivers to transfer to factory jobs now. So let me move on to uh, conclude. The COVID crisis reveals the injustice of the guest worker system and also the broader regime of social exclusion and inequality, grounded on both the external border which involves visa regulation and quarantine requirement and the internal border, which involves hierarchical access to civil rights and risk management within the country. It is time to reform the current system of migrant workers recruitment and employment and their marginalized working and living conditions. I hope that the pandemic can become a moment of reflection and solidarity for us to recognize migrant workers' critical contribution to and essential membership in the host community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lan, for this um, case study essentially from, uh, from Taiwan with the uh, largest uh, risks and threats to the uh, migrant population over there. Uh, from Taiwan, we move to uh, Japan uh, to the next speaker, uh, that is uh, Gabriel Vogt professor for Japanology. Um, I have understood that when it comes to Japan, there is some easing going on now uh, that has been announced in the next couple of days. Is that going to solve everything all at once? Well, thank you so much, Sjord, for um, the introduction and for jumping right into um, the current and ongoing public debates in or political debates in Japan, I should say. Um, there is easing going on, but let's see how, how far that is going to impact the situation. Um, for now, it's my, my honor to contribute to this panel and to this conference uh, with a case study from Japan. Um, 
so it has often been said that the virus does not discriminate. Uh, and that is, of course, not entirely true. There are different degrees of vulnerability in any society. And as we heard in the keynote lecture, vulnerability is as much a social and a political issue as it is a medical one. Migrant workers in Japan and elsewhere around the globe are oftentimes engaged in workplaces where they face a high exposure <coughs> risk to the virus. They are among the most vulnerable groups in any society. And now in my presentation on Japan, I will address three issues. First, I will give you a brief overview over the border control measures that have been put in place in Japan during this pandemic. Secondly, I will address the general working and living conditions of migrant workers in Japan and give special attention to the situation of the particularly vulnerable group of international trainees. And thirdly, I will introduce the case of migrant nurses in Japan as an exemplary group of frontline workers in this pandemic. So firstly, um, it's two days after the WHO's declaration of public health emergency of international concern on January 30, 2020, Japan closed its borders to Chinese citizens with a passport issued in Hubei province, um, travelers from other Chinese provinces and areas in South Korea, subsequently from Iran, were one by one put on the list of non-entry permission to Japan. And over the course of March 2020, Japan banned the entry of passengers from any of the major EU countries and on April 1st border closure for passengers from China, South Korea, the US, UK, Brazil and 44 other countries was authorized and this interestingly enough was only one day after the decision to postpone the Tokyo Olympics was made public. Now what is remarkable is that Japan not only banned short-term visitors um, such as tourists um, from entering the country but also issued a re-entry ban for foreign residents of Japan which was in effect for five months and only in the final quarter of 2020 under then uh, Prime Minister Suga several relaxations and rules of entry to Japan were tested and from mid mid January 2021 However, most of them were revoked, and as of today, Japan's borders largely remain closed for several groups, such as international students and workers. And I should note, indeed, that um, some two days ago, uh, now under newly elected Prime Minister Kishida, it has been announced that the rules, uh, the entry rules for business travelers and other groups will see some significant relaxation, probably as early as next week. Despite this latest policy turn, many young people, be they students, working holiday makers, those with actual work contracts, still face much uncertainty regarding their potential entry to Japan. So secondly, let me focus on the international workers currently residing in Japan. In pre-pandemic 2019, the number of foreign residents in Japan peaked at 2.9 million, and it had seen a steady increase over um, three decades almost. Contrary to official policy goals, however, the bulk of Japan's migrant population does not reside in Japan on a visa that is based on their professional qualification. But much more, they reside in Japan based on family relations, Japanese ancestry, or as students and international trainees. And many of them indeed do fill low wage, low prestige jobs in Japan, oftentimes as contract or part time workers, and often enough in precarious labor situations. The so called international trainees, who make up 14% of the total number of foreign residents in Japan, are a particularly vulnerable group. And some early ethnographic fieldwork among the Vietnamese trainees in Japan, which make up half of the number of overall trainees in Japan, um, and which was conducted by uh, a young scholar, Tran, has revealed their heightened vulnerability. From their meager salaries, they had not been able to acquire any savings. Also, cases of labor rights violations, sadly, are not rare. Although, in response to the COVID situation, the Japanese government implemented reforms to the system, such as enabling trainees to change employers in case their original employer, for example, went out of business. Many of them eventually found themselves without employment, nevertheless. In fact, two thirds of migrant workers in Japan faced either the loss of their employment or significantly reduced working hours and salaries. 
And in many cases, their visas expired, but trainees were unable to return home for a lack of available air traffic. Moreover, persons on an expired visa were not eligible to collect the 10,000 yen relief fund that was given out to all residents in Japan, no matter their nationality. Also, the structural hurdles and language barriers to applying for this relief fund in the first place were high, and migration scholar Asato estimates that only 50% of migrant workers in Japan were successful in clearing those hurdles. So many trainees reported that next to increased financial risks, they also experienced an increased anxiety over health issues. A general lack of information, difficulties in reaching out to support groups, and a growing desire to go back home all contributed to high levels of mental stress. And this resonates with data from Tokyo Coronavirus Support Center for Foreign Residents. About one quarter of the calls received to this helpline in 2020 were about economic difficulties and roughly another quarter about health anxieties. So what crises like the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan, for example, saw a surge in volunteer activities. In the ongoing pandemic, support activism from civil society groups has largely plummeted, probably in response to individual fears of contracting the virus and an inability to comply with safety protocols during support actions. I'm coming to my third point. Let me highlight the situation of international healthcare workers in Japan to showcase how frontline workers experienced their life and work in Japan during the pandemic. Since the mid 2000s, Japan has been actively recruiting nurses and elder caregivers from the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam to come and work in Japan. And the recruitment system has many high hurdles. In particular, the high level of Japanese language proficiency that is required and the non-acknowledgement of degrees from sending countries is being widely criticized. And in a recent study, uh, Hirano and Yoneno report of several additional problems that this migration scheme is facing under pandemic circumstances. The dispatch of new workers already under contract in Japan has been interrupted. This was an outcome of Japan's travel ban and in the case of the Philippines, also of a national policy that temporarily prevented healthcare workers from leaving the country. Another problem within the EPA system was that it requests pre-departure language training in the sending countries, which was impossible in several places due to school closures that were in place, and a switch to online learning only slowly enacted, if at all. And consequently, many potential migrants could not acquire the requested certificate of Japanese language proficiency tests. Moreover, the tests itself on some occasions had to be canceled following safety uh, measures. As a result, Japan basically faces a lack in newly arriving international healthcare workers. And those who are in Japan have gained mixed experiences during the pandemic. Some are quoted saying that they feel actually lucky to be in Japan rather than in their home countries because they feel they face a reduced risk at the workplace and in private life to contract the virus in Japan. Also, the relationship with the Japanese co-workers improved. While somewhat distanced in pre-pandemic times, some migrant health workers now report of a joint crisis experience and a professional spirit that glued the co-workers together. Positive reports are also heard regarding their private encounters with Japanese. Many experienced xenophobic discrimination at the onset of the pandemic. After the travel ban was enacted, though, this changed, and a feeling of joint suffering emerged within the local communities. And this made many migrant workers feel more welcome and appreciated in their communities. So let me conclude my remarks by supporting what is often being said about the pandemic acting as a magnifier to social problems. We see a further marginalization of migrant workers in Japan. We see their financial hardships and socially exclusion. We currently even see a civil society distracting from their usual overwhelming support for the troubled and needy. And we see a political leadership that tends to keep foreigners at bay at at times of crisis. of vaccination passports implemented at this point. On the other hand, some testimonies of the migrant health workers 
about a newly experienced sense of community at the workplace and beyond might be the silver lining that speaks of some change that is ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vogt, for sharing your perspectives. It's funny because some of the points you're making here, uh, migrant workers or people from abroad working here in China, uh, share this idea as well of feeling much more safe than uh, actually being in their home countries. Um, so there's uh, some resemblance of some of the experiences, I think, in, in Japan as well, here in uh, in China, on the mainland at least. Um, from uh, the Japanese perspective, we go to New Delhi. Um, That's the third speaker of uh, this panel. Um, we hear from uh, Shabari Nair with the uh, International Labour Organization. You're covering very interesting countries, I think, there in, in South Asia. Uh, it's a very different scene, I think, in, in many ways uh, compared to what we see uh, here uh, in East Asia, so to say. Could you give us uh, that deep dive in the region uh, that you're covering over there? Thanks a lot, Sjord. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is such a fantastic opportunity and I really um, would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers as well for inviting the International Labour Organization to present here. Now, I don't come from an academic background, Sior, so I'm going to take this opportunity to be much more policy oriented in this conversation from my very side. Very good. So go ahead. Um, Sior, so I am an Indian national. Uh, originally, this is where I come from, and uh, I was born in the Middle East. Uh, I was born in India, raised in the Middle East, uh, and which is where I spent a good part of my formative years. So really coming back to India now and being posted to cover South Asia, as you said, interesting countries uh, um, also means that while we have tremendous opportunities, we have to cut through the many layers of challenges. Right. And these challenges are ones that are wrought with inequalities, labor, labor market dysfunctionalities, sensitivities at the political level with regards to cross border movements. And in countries like India, which um, which we need to look at as a sum of its parts and people moving within the country itself are considered to be migrant workers internal. And we know examples like this in the context of China, for instance, right? Um, so that's the kind of a region I cover. So let me give you some facts and figures to also help move us into a possible conversation that leads us into COVID and where we are now in South Asia. The Global estimates, the ILO's global estimates for the total number of international migrant workers in the world is 164 million. Out of the 164, uh, sorry, the 2000s, that's the 2017 estimates, the 2019 estimates, uh, which is the most uh, recently released ones is 169. So we saw an increase of 5 million migrant workers there. We don't have a 2021 estimate. And when that is released in the next year or so, we will see the effect of COVID, right? So let's go by the 2019 estimates of 169 million migrant workers. Out of these 169 million migrant workers, close to 50 million come from South Asia. So almost one third of the global migrant worker population come from this region. Now, within that, India alone is the largest migrant worker sending country in the world, as per the 2020 United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UN DESA estimates, it's over 18 million. Now, 18 million may sound uh, very small to India, a population of 1.36 billion, so what, less than a percent? of people from India outside. But then, sure, you look at me and other Indians and go, my gosh, there are Indians all over the world, right? I mean, we're, we're all over the place, but that's 18 million for you. That's the impact that 18 million people can have around the world when they're distributed as the largest diaspora in the world. Now, 
Let's also understand in terms of when migrant workers leave the country or when somebody leaves the country and becomes a migrant worker, what is the main intention? A decent work perspective. All right, now, this is what the ILO constantly advocates for in any aspect of our my job, in any aspect of the ILO's work. It's constantly to focus on decent work. Now, decent work for a migrant worker includes the elements pertaining to social protection, productive employment, labor standards that are adequately, uh, uh, so to say, given to migrant workers for to enforce in terms of their rights and protection. Um, and uh, in the context of decent work, also ensuring social dialogue. Now, these are the four elements that we look at in the context of decent work. So out of these 50 million migrant workers, approximately, give or take, we're talking about close to 23 million just in the Middle East. That is in the corridor with the Gulf states, right? It's predominantly the Gulf states, the six countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council, and perhaps uh, of quite a few in Jordan and Lebanon. So these are the big destination states. And just in the Arab states, particularly in the GCC, we see over 23 million migrant workers and majority of them from South Asia. Now, in this context of the movements that we talk about, out of these 23 million, close to 19 million are men and over 4 million are women. So I would like us to constantly be able to have this conversation by also bringing in the gender lens, by also thinking about what female migrant workers go through, what kind of sectors they work in. For instance, I think we heard uh, Pecha or, uh, or even Gabrielle talk about nurses, right? Uh, and majority nurses are women, but also in the context of the Middle East, a large number of care workers and domestic workers who are not in that professional sector of nursing are also women. Right. So also to keep this in mind as we have this conversation. Now, when COVID struck, we had uh, the ILO decided to release, you know, monitor uh, the situation on the labor markets in the different countries uh, across the world. And we released in the fifth um, in, in the in the in the fifth monitoring report, if I'm not mistaken, we released a whole range of statistics on the, the Arab states. And in, those, in that particular report, we announced that over 8 million jobs were expected to be lost in the Middle East alone. Now, when you have such a big migrant worker population in the Arab states, who do you think is going to be fired first when a pandemic strikes? So we always say migrant workers to be the first to be fired and the last to be hired. In that context, we expected, and rightly so, a huge exodus back to their home countries. India alone repatriated over 8 million migrant workers from around the world. Majority of them came from the Middle East. Over 8 million. Now, in this context of so many migrant workers returning, they were returning to countries where, once again, it was not a rosy picture. They were returning to countries with dysfunctional labor markets, with social protection measures which were in tatters. They were, lit they were returning to countries which were absolutely broken down in terms of their own jobs and decent work capacities, in terms of their own social dialogue measures, trade unions having to face their own problems, employers totally losing out on profits or trying to then work on profit driven motives rather than looking at it from a worker's perspective. So it was chaos. This is the chaos that migrant workers were coming back to. So let us look at it just from the repatriation measure. Now, who coordinated these repatriation measures? And that will give you an understanding of the governance systems in these countries. For instance, in the, in the country that I'm based out of, New Delhi in India, India, the migration governance system is managed by the Ministry of External Affairs, which is foreign affairs. In Pakistan, it's the Ministry of Human Resources and Overseas Pakistanis. 
In Bangladesh, it's the Ministry of Expatriates, Welfare and Overseas Employment. In Sri Lanka, it's the Ministry of Foreign Employment. And in Nepal, it's the Ministry of Labor. How is there going to be a regional conversation in the context of migration when each country approaches it through a different ministerial lens. So every time we talk about labor migration governance, we need to also understand within the government, which is the ministry that takes the lead in the conversation on migration in that country. That will then help us dig deeper in how the country will prioritize migration. Take for instance, in the context of remittances, India in 2019 was the largest recipient of remittances in the world, over $82 billion. But that $82 billion contributed to only 2.6% of the national GDP. Now, as per the 2020 World Bank estimates, the remittances went down only by a bit in India, but actually went up in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Now you start wondering, wait, if it was COVID, people were losing jobs, how did remittances go up? But for that, you need to understand the social costs of migration and which is the fact that previously when migrant workers perhaps kept $100 more with them for their expenses, this time they started sending back over 90% of those costs or whatever they had, over 90% of it, they started sending back home. So every penny to help serve their families with regards to the bread and butter that that was needed for for the family's existence right so remittance is therefore being such a big angle and this is something that governments always focused on but now remittances were going to fall remittances are going to fall sharply and we're going to see this in the next next year when the world bank releases this year's um, global estimates on remittances and we're going to see remittances fall sharply and I hope I stand to be corrected or proved wrong. And if that is the case, then we will have to rethink in terms of policy conversations. Let me also bring in the element of when people come back, they need to be reintegrated into the labor market. There are very few countries in the region that have really developed policies for reintegration of migrant workers. And that is because nine out of 10 times you think, well, I'm an Indian. I, you know, I told you I, I grew up in, 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 in one of the Middle Eastern countries. My father came back after 35 years. Well, did my father really think it was going to be difficult to reintegrate in his own country? Maybe not. But was it difficult? Practically, yes, it was. Because it was not the country that he left in 1975 that he was coming back to in 2007 to settle down. Right. So that makes it a very difficult uh, reintegration process, even for migrant workers. And that was not necessarily considered as an adequate priority, policy priority by governments here, which has changed. So COVID as a health issue then led to a jobs crisis, which then led to a conversation on labor market reintegration. Let me give you an example. In Sri Lanka, they introduced something called as the skills passport. The skills passport is basically to profile migrant workers on the kind of skills they were coming back with so that they can adequately connect them to the relevant employers who are looking for these skills. <laughs> India introduced something called as the skills work, skilled workers database. And this was to again focus on the kind of skills that migrant workers were coming back with. These are fantastic proactive measures, but they need to be sustainable into the longer term. So skills development, therefore, comes in very strongly in the context of this health crisis that we're talking about uh, for migrant workers. Fair recruitment. And I'll conclude with a couple of these last points, Stuart. Fair recruitment. A lot of migrant workers are taking a lot of debt Right. They're incurring a lot of debt, taking a lot of loans to be actually able to be uh, paying, paying the recruitment agent to leave and then go abroad. These migrant workers, in the case of I'll give you an example, in the case of Bangladesh, migrant workers, we did a survey with the government of Bangladesh and discovered that migrant workers were paying close to 17.5 months of their wages as recruitment costs and related fees. 17.5 months. I am very proud to be working, very privileged to be working for an organization like the ILO. But even if I was asked for one day of my salary as a recruitment cost to join the ILO, I would be the first person to say thanks, but no thanks. So if we, so you and I will not pay for our recruitment, why should a migrant worker 
pay for recruitment costs when the demand for them is clearly there from the country of uh, destination side. So that's important for us to keep in mind as we look at this. So imagine them now losing jobs, having to repay their debt uh, to the uh, to the banks or the money lenders they've taken that money from, uh, having paid, uh, not gotten 17 and a half months of their wages, now coming back as a result of a health crisis. How is that going to affect not just the migrant worker, but the country of origin itself? A final point from yeah. my side. None of these conversations can happen without proper bilateral agreements between the country of origin and destination. I'm just coming out of the Abu Dhabi dialogue in the UAE, where the Gulf countries and the Asian countries came together. And one of the first points that was made was actually by the government of the Philippines, which spoke about thanking, which thanked the government of uh, governments of the destination countries, saying, thank you for taking care of our migrant workers particularly with vaccinations. This happens because of good bilateral labor migration agreements. And these now need to be revamped, strengthened regional conversations, interregional conversations, and global multilateral conversations, therefore, are so very important for us to ensure that this really goes forward in the absolute protection of migrant workers. Thanks so much, sir. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. This was really interesting and mainly the part of, of, of re-migration to, to the old habitat, so to say, to the, uh, to the country of, uh, of origin. Uh, the floor is open for, for questions. Um, maybe to start uh, with you, uh, Shabari, I was wondering, do you think that the people who are now coming back to, to, to India in, in would they ever uh, dare to make this step again uh, and go abroad to work? Will it be uh, resuming uh, to be a normal situation once border controls are lifted? Absolutely. Um, I, I think, and to a larger extent, we are going to see massive remigrations. Um, and this remigration that we are seeing is also because. As I said, reintegration policies are just being put in place. Reintegration measures are just being considered. Now, if we were to leave that out of the equation, governments in the region are also looking at new labor markets, right? Because we are in a situation where people migrating from South Asia is not new. You know, it's, it's, it's traditional. It's almost, it's almost a part and parcel of life that people move in this region. And if that is the case, uh, for instance, governments are now looking at Japan. Um, so Gabriel and your presentation is so resonating for someone like me because I've just been talking to governments uh, in the Abu Dhabi dialogue in Dubai where they have, Japan is not a member of the Abu Dhabi dialogue, uh, but they have signed, uh, Japan has signed uh, memorandums of cooperation with five countries of origin in South Asia, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, for skilled professionals and for interns. That's new labor market migration, huh? because this is not the traditional market. The traditional market is the Gulf, Malaysia, Singapore. That's where most South Asians move to. Uh, but now we're looking at non-traditional methods. We're also looking at conversations between South Asian countries and African countries, right? In terms of the movement into Africa, mainly to work in businesses, small and medium enterprises there. So there's a lot of conversations around these lines, um, uh, Stuart, and, and, and certainly the Gulf is never going to be uh, the, it's never going to not be a dream for a migrant worker from South Asia, right? Uh, I, when, when I go to the Middle East, uh, I, I don't even know, need to speak English the way I'm speaking now. I just need to speak in Malayalam, which is my mother tongue from Kerala, right? Uh, because uh, the, the two most widely spoken languages in the Middle East would actually be um, Arabic or Malayalam. Right. Um, so just to point it out, it's it's always going to be there because social networks are so important in that migration scenario. Thanks. Uh, there's a question from the from the audience uh, for Dr. Lan uh, about uh, uh, social networks, support networks amongst guest worker populations. Um, how have those support networks uh, reacted to this whole COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis and to all the labor vulnerabilities uh, uh, associated with it. Yeah, informal social networks are, are definitely critical, especially for those migrants who are quarantined 
or, or restricted from uh, in, in terms of physical movements. And I think the key is the availability of cell phone and access to internet. So a lot of migrant workers actually use Facebook or Instagram to post photos, videos, or, or you know, write posts about their experience uh, um, of quarantine. And, and, and that really uh, got circulated also among the Taiwanese community, rest concern from the media and even the legislators. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, when, when we interview factory workers and care workers, uh, care workers actually complain less about the restriction of physical movement or, or, or the policy having no day off. Because to start with, they had very few days off anyway. So they usually have one day off each month. So, uh, but also they got more opportunity of what I call micro movement because they are the person who get grocery for the family. So they still go out and they go out, they have the opportunity to mingle with the co-ethnic uh, migrant workers. So that gives them some kind of informal support as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to Japan, um, it, how, how attractive is Japan still for uh, migrants? I mean, is it a place, uh, a long-term destination where migrants would still want to move to? Uh, what are the, the long-term, you think, implications uh, uh, for the Japanese economy and the internationalization of, of Japan as well? Mm -hmm. Um well, uh, honestly speaking, I think Japan is losing in attractiveness for international migrants. Um, but we probably have to distinguish with regard to, you know, what kind of migrants are we talking about? So we see this rise in numbers really um, coming from, um, as was already mentioned, a di diversity of regions, really. So Vietnam is now a major sending country, also Nepal. Um, and we see a lot of migrants um, coming from these countries to Japan, but with a very clear perspective of this is this is going to be a temporary uh, gig and i will not make a, a living in japan forever um so i think there there is um there is a trend of seeing japan as a stepping stone probably for an onward migration from there to other countries uh, in particular well the classical ones uh, canada us australia even um and if we have a look at the, the high skilled migrants, um, there is there is a lot of research these days coming out comparing Japan with Singapore, for example. And um, Singapore comes on out on top uh, with regard to attractiveness compared to Japan. There is a language issue. So in Japan, even even as a high skilled migrant in a, in a white collar job, um, at some point, you will need Japanese language um, um, proficiency, and that is hard to acquire, and not so much uh, the case in other countries. Um, and then, um, in particular, now with the border closure um, that also affected the, the permanent residence for five months, that may well um, be a game changer uh, in hindsight, because a lot of the permanent residents who really committed to living in Japan um, they, they were cut off from their apartments, their jobs, their families in, in some cases. Um, and now there is quite a debate with regard to this first class citizenship, second class citizenship, and where do we, you know, where, where do we find our place as migrants? So all of that is, is not making the outlook very rosy for Japan as a country of destination, I would say. Now, if, if you're talking about Singapore, um, and if you can talk about winners and losers uh, in, in, in this whole aftermath of the COVID crisis, so to say, um, is there any winners here? Is there any losers? Um, how, how is Taiwan uh, holding up, you think, uh, uh, Dr. Lan, over the next couple of months slash years? Um, at what people often ask me, uh, the bargaining power migrant workers acquire during a pandemic would be a very temporary short-lived things or okay, it actually has a long lasting effect. And I think the question is um, a little bit both. I think in general, I do see a, a shifting market dynamic. Like there is a declining labor supply 
and not just because of the pandemic, but also because there are new destination countries such as Japan and South Korea, which has become more attractive to, to the migrant, especially the higher educated ones. Um, but, but, but at the same time, I think the, the system we do need to, uh, the pandemic might also create some opportunity for the Taiwanese, for the host country to, to reconsider the regime, to improve the working and living condition. So, so they could provide, um, they could attract more migrants, especially in a time uh, they face international competition with other countries. Mm -hmm. There's a question from the audience. What is the potential impact of this trend in, in labor mobility to um, the newly uh, graduates? And maybe we start for that in, in New Delhi, uh, South Asia. As far as the new graduates are concerned, um, where, where are they graduating from? Are they going to be graduating from big cities or are they going to be graduating from smaller towns? If they're going to be graduating from smaller towns, um, the the question about their, 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 the certificates that they have gotten, the degrees that they've gotten comes into question. Uh, whether their skills will be recognized in with as much aplomb as the skills that people from better universities and bigger towns come from, right? Um, uh, the other aspect to that is uh, the graduates, uh, majority of them who, who are coming out now understand perhaps better what the labor market in their own countries is, particularly in the kind of fields that they're in. Now, uh, take for instance, a lot of student mobility in the context of South Asia is spoken about for towards Europe as a movement towards Europe, um, perhaps US and Australia. Uh, and that is also one that you where you will find a lot of uh, uh, students uh, uh, being a part of bilateral labor migration agreements between the student mobility will be considered as bilateral labor migration uh, uh, agreement between countries of origin and destination. So India has been doing this, for instance, with the UK. Uh, Nepal and Bangladesh have been doing it with some of the Southeast Asian countries. So Singapore is a one big destination for student mobility there. Uh, and that includes in the context of new graduates, um, if they are in the IT field, then that would be uh, once again a whole different uh, strata of people who are coming in, who are looking at this issue. Nurses always in demand. We're talking about nurses from Philippines, nurses from uh, India. These are the biggest uh, cohort of nurses uh, around the world. Uh, and, and if they have just graduated, I can guarantee you this, uh, nurses are going to be the frontline workers that are really in demand all over the world. And if that is the case, then countries like India are going to put stronger, uh, uh, let's say, impositions before somebody can take away a healthcare worker from their own country. Right. Um, they are going to first try and see how they can employ them domestically for the for for for, for the situation here. I'll stop there. Sure. Yeah. Professor Vo. Mm -hmm. I would totally agree on the case of the nurses. They they will always be in demand, uh, um, and even the the newly graduates um, and those who who don't really have significant years of work experience. So that's really not an issue, I think. Um, but but what's what's Probably with regard to Japan and the question of you know what chances do the newly graduates have on the labor market, um, this might be a Japan specific, but many of the newly graduates, uh, foreign newly graduates that are hired in Japan, they are actually graduating from Japanese universities. So very rarely on it, you know, people would make this this move to Japan as a newly graduate with a foreign degree and then enter a Japanese company. Um, they might work for international companies in Japan, but maybe not so much for Japanese ones. So, and, and I think this, this is where we see um, a strong disruption now through the pandemic because student mobility to Japan has been down for yeah, for, for almost two years now. And as somebody who's running a Japanese studies program, I can tell you it is so frustrating. Every every other month you get these emails from your partner university saying, well, sorry, uh, it's it's not going to be back up next semester. Uh, so please, uh, you know, reschedule and talk to your students. And I can tell you that some of our students, they are giving up on even trying to go uh, and study abroad in Japan because it is so frustrating and there is no real perspective and they don't know when this would 
would happen. And so since there are fewer and fewer international students actually making the way to Japanese universities, there will be fewer of them graduating from Japanese universities and eventually coming onto, onto the Japanese labor market. Having said that, again, it's a different story for international companies in Japan who would recruit on a global um, basis, who would hold job fairs all across Europe uh, and, and other places in the world. So maybe we won't see that much of an impact for the international companies, but uh, I expect to see quite an impact in, in a you know, downturning of numbers uh, of international newly high risk for Japanese companies. Uh, and for the people in country, uh, Dr. Lan, it actually could be beneficial, right, that there's not a lot of labor mobility at this point in time. Yeah. So, um, is there a question? <laughs> Well, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it brings benefits for the people who are already there, uh, speak the language, right. for instance, have the skills that they, they might actually have a much more advantageous position uh, right now, simply because there's not uh, as much choice on the labor market. Right. But you also have to consider that for those people who wanted to return, or who, want, who, who they just wanted to go home for vacation, for their children's graduation, for their daughter's wedding, they are unable mm -hmm. to. Because if they leave, they are afraid they won't be able to re-enter. So, so there, there is a pro and con, I think, for those people who are forced to stay uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're running uh, out of time almost already i think we are already over time so i would like to uh, thank you very very much uh, for this for this great panel discussion i think we could have talked for for another hour uh, or so uh, dr lan uh, professor vogt uh, mr nair thank you very very much uh, for being here today i hope the next event uh, but that might take another one or two years uh, will be an in-person event again but thank you so much uh, for tuning in uh, today and for the audience please give them a warm uh, virtual applause again thank you so much thank you so much all the best thank you to all the speakers for these amazing talks such a complex region so many complex problems but explained in an accessible manner so thank you for that um, this is a lot of information that we will need to process so it's an excellent moment for a break um, we have we'll have a two minute break so we'll be back at 37 ish uh, and we'll restart then. Thank you very much. In late 2019, an unknown virus started spreading in Wuhan, China. The World Health Organization, or WHO, is responsible for the oversight of global disease outbreaks, including for what is now known as COVID-19. How was the relationship between China and the WHO during this period? China has been a key partner of the WHO. WHO received all information about the unknown disease from China. And based on the International Health Regulations, IHR, China is obliged to report and communicate with the WHO regarding the disease outbreak. This relationship became strained in later months. What happened? Some countries also questioned about the reliability of the WHO information given by China. Countries like the US even suspected that the health organization has been effectively controlled by the Chinese government. During our trip to China, uh, we were uh, very impressed with the level of engagement of, of the Chinese government at all levels. China's possible influence in the WHO sparked a global debate. But to what extent is this influence real? By looking at the composition of WHO staffs and the number of WHO collaboration centers, we find that China's influence in WHO is still limited uh, so far. China's finding to WHO is also insignificant, no matter it is compared to Western countries or even Western NGOs. So the relationship between China and the United States became strained under the Trump administration, with the WHO in the middle. Will this continue in the future?
we've seen the United States under um, Joe Biden's administration send a positive signal to collaborate with China in terms of climate change. However, we seldom see such similar signal sent to the Chinese government in terms of collaborating on combating the global health crisis. It actually has become a race in terms of uh, vaccination diplomacy, for example. If there's no initiative taken by any of the power, I'm afraid we would foresee a more zero-sum narratives on global health crisis governance. All right, that was quick. Welcome back, everyone. Let's get this party restarted. Next up, we have a roundtable discussion titled, Where Do We Go From Here? The Effects of COVID-19 on Global Health Governance in Asia. To moderate, we have none other than Professor Sarah Davies of the School of Government and International Relations at Griffith, Griffith University in Australia. Um, I had the pleasure of listening to some of, pro, some of uh, Professor Davies' informing but inspiring talks while I was a young generation fellow at the Australian Institute for International Affairs which is apparently the only place that still counts me as young. Um, professor Davies is also a adjunct professor at the Monash Gender Peace and Security Center for the School of Social Sciences at, Mon Sciences at Monash University. And her current research focuses on global health governance and the women peace and security agenda. She has been an Australian Research Council Discovery Australian Postgraduate Award Scholar and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow uh, a lot of titles, yes. Um, she's also the author of multiple books, including Global Politics of Health, Disease Diplomacy, and Containing Contagion, The Politics of Disease Outbreaks in Southeast Asia. Um, but, you know, she wasn't just satisfied with just books, so she also has published in globally renowned Nature, uh, The Lancet, International Studies Quarterly, International Affairs, and Medical Law Review, among others. Uh, while being a co-editor of the peer review journals, Australian Journal and International Affairs. It is therefore my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Professor Sarah Davies. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction there, Anoma. And it was wonderful to, to meet you uh, not so long ago, actually. So thank you for that. I much appreciate that generous introduction. So I would like to acknowledge country, which is something that we always do uh, in where I'm located. So I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagara people on whose land I appreciate being able to come to you from today. And I respect their elders past, present and emerging. We have three fantastic panelists and it's a real delight to present each of them in turn. Uh, and I really look forward to hearing them today. So our first speaker is Jerome Kim, Dr. Jerome Kim, who is the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. He is an international expert on the evaluation and development of vaccines. As I said, the Director General of the IVI, whose mission is to discover, develop and develop, deliver safe, effective and affordable vaccines for global health. Dr. Kim has an extraordinarily depth and breadth of scientific expertise and experience. Uh, from basic research to advanced clinical development. Uh, his oral corollary vaccine is used around the world to prevent deadly diarrheal disease. And IVI is also working on several different vaccines against COVID, including the clinical testing of a DNA vaccine at Seoul National University Hospital and a Genexine COVID-19 vaccine at Severance Hospital. Dr. Kim has authored over 300 publications, received the John Mayer Award for Research Excellence from the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences in 2013, and the Department of Army Research and Development Award for Technical Excellence in 2013. Dr. Kim is an adjunct professor of medicine at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences and at Yonsei University Graduate School of Public Health, and a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the Infectious Diseases Society of America. He has an impressive history of developing vaccines, leading HIV vaccine trials, and also is a graduate from the University of Hawaii with honors in history, biology, and his MD from Yale University School of Medicine. Our second speaker is Dr. Remco van der Pass, who is a public health doctor and a global health researcher. He has a position as Senior Research Fellow, Global Health Policy at the Institute of Tropical Medicine Antwerp, and is a lecturer in global health at the Department of Health 
Ethics and Society in the Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Sciences at Maastricht University. His teaching and research focuses on global health governance, political economy and foreign policy with a special attention on health, workforce development and migration, health system strengthening, social protection, health financing, global health security, globalization and impact on health equity. Remco is a board member of the Medicus Mundi International Network Health for All, a visiting research fellow at Clannendale Netherlands Institute of International Relations and editorial board member of the academic journal Globalization and Health. He has worked as a policy advisor for Weymouth, a public health foundation advocating for social justice and health equity, and medical coordinator for NGO Medicines du Monde, of which the largest part of Papua New Guinea, Post Papua, Indonesia. Remco has a PhD dissertation focused on global health policy and the international governance of global health workforce and labour migration. Finally, our third speaker is Dr. Nicholas Thomas, who is an associate professor in the Department of Asian and International Studies at the City University of Hong Kong. He also coordinates the One Health Cluster in the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. His research encompasses East Asian politics and security studies, particularly health security, and I've known Dr. Thomas for some time and can attest to the quality of his research. On the latter, he is currently involved in two projects. The first is a survey of vaccine nationalism and diplomacy in India. And this project involves colleagues in Hong Kong and in India. And the second project is a six country study of determinants to pandemic response in Southeast Asia with colleagues in Hong Kong. Dr. Thomas is a frequent commentator in the Asian international media on the unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a real honour today to be able to introduce these three excellent speakers and I would kindly ask uh, Dr Kim to first speak on this topic of where do we go from here. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and it's uh, a, an honour and a, a pleasure to speak at the uh, KAS Symposium. Um, where do we go from here? Well, you know, in Korea, we just they just announced the Living with COVID effort and um, gatherings are now permitted. People are talking about going out after work. Um, you know, life is uh, moving on. Um, at the same time, the number of infections has spiked uh, to a level um, above 2,000 infections per day, population of 51 million, um, which is higher than it than the government that many people feel comfortable with. But I think one of the things that we are getting used to is the idea that because of vaccination the simple reporting of infections does not have the same implication that it did a year and a half ago. And so I think that as the government is rolling this policy out, it's also saying at the same time, there are other things that we're looking at now and we have to be careful and you have to be careful. Uh, we are, are removing restrictions, but we could very well reinstitute them if things uh, go wrong. Uh, at the same time, I, I know from the vaccine perspective, you know, we are making 1.5 to 2 billion doses of vaccine a month. Uh, we had unprecedented speed of, you know, development of safe and efficacious vaccines. Now, at least actually today, an eighth vaccine was approved by WHO, emergency use listed, uh, from the Indian company Bharat. So, you know, we could, we showed that we could do it. We're making a huge number of vaccines yet today, 50% of the world has not received a single dose. 3.7 percent of the low-income countries have been back. People in low-income countries have received a first dose. That would that would mean that you know 96.3 percent have not received any dose, in, particularly in low-income countries. So there is a huge problem with equity and access to these vaccines. And at the same time, additional new vaccines. You know, there are a number of companies with that are beginning to report their phase three results. And the big question is, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to get these billions of doses out? Are we going to be able to ensure that the world that can barely vaccinate 130 million children who are born every year can vaccinate 8 billion people? And what are we going to do about surveillance and tracking of mutants? And you know, do countries have the infrastructure, the scientific infrastructure to do that? And do they have the clinical infrastructure to distribute 8 to 16 billion additional doses of vaccine with an additional 8 billion every time we talk about a booster dose or a new uh, vaccine against a variant. So there are a lot of questions that are going to be ongoing questions. And as we look to the future, 
and a future with, you know, passport, uh, vaccine passports or proof of vaccination and, and, and all these other things that countries are developing, how are we going to make sense of it all? Where is it all going to be controlled? And, and really, this gets to an even bigger question of who's in charge. And actually, it's, it's kind of interesting that your other guests should be able to address the problem of governance, because with this, we've had a number of countries somewhat moving together, but often we've had countries moving and some of the major, some of the leaders moving off in different directions. And how do we manage a global pandemic if we're not all working together with a plan? Sorry, my mic wasn't on. Thank you. That's quite daunting, uh, but but important. I think clarion call for us to think about where do we go from here? And we're actually in a situation where there there is still not the pandemic is still not over, uh, and it's really important to keep in mind. Now, please. Th thank you so much, Dr. Kim. I really appreciate. It. I think we're going to have a lot of questions after your presentation. Uh, may I kindly now ask uh, Remco, Dr. Van der Pust, please. Uh, come and speak. Just can't hear you, sorry. Still no, still no sound, sorry. Still no sound, sorry. Have you unplugged your earphones? That might help. So while we're getting our sound ready, I hope you're all thinking of the questions that you want to ask. Uh, Still no sound? Okay, so if it's okay, we'll move on to, to Dr. Nicholas Thomas, and then we'll come back to Dr. Remo van der Pass. Uh, Nick, would I please be able to ask you to please uh, bring your camera on and your mic on? Thank you. I could pretend at this point not to hear you, um, but I, I think I'll, I don't want to throw it back to Remco too quickly. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that overly generous um, introduction, um, very much. Um, and also, obviously, thank you to the people at CAS um, and the foundation who organized this very, very interesting uh, conference. I have eight minutes to somehow summarize where we're going to from here, and that's a library in and of itself um, in answering. So I think what I want to do is just maybe focus on on four things, um, just very, very briefly, I guess, across those four things. The first is that I think it's important to remember that COVID really upended a lot of our preconceptions back in December 19, um, January, 20, uh, January 2020. You have to remember that prior to that, and when we're talking about as if it was two, if it was uh, the H1N outbreak in 2009, or if it was um, SARS or the bird flu outbreak, um, there was strong opposition, for example, to people putting up quarantines, large scale quarantines, or stopping trade and travel. Uh, with COVID, that was upended because of what China did in Wuhan. And then those large-scale quarantines were largely replicated further afield. That's just a simple snapshot. The other areas where I think COVID's upended or generated debate, perhaps, shall I say, is in terms of what is the, what is the key X factor um, in the way we respond to a disease? Um, is it about governance? Is it about the political systems? I mean, in Asia... We have largely either authoritarian or liberal states. We have very few democracies across the region as a whole. East Asia, focusing here. Um, you know, 
and there was always there's there's been the back and forth debate, which no one different uh, statistical databases are coming up with different responses as to does one particular system of governance do better than the other. Um, there's the issue of the role of trust and how much of a role does trust play um, in responding to a pandemic? What are the levels we need to see people at? Is it about trust in government or is it about trust in medical authorities? Do you need both? Is it about social capital trust? Um, again, different cases across our region are showing different examples here as to sort of which might be a more important aspect. And then the socio-cultural determinants. I mean, we've already heard from people and we've already lived through this anyway. Um, you have the issue of education, uh, of gender, of um, the role of culture and religion. And so what I think COVID has done is actually, in a way, to use a medical metaphor, um, torn the Band-Aid off a lot of academic assumptions that were existing prior to this. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here for us to be able to build up a more comprehensive understanding um, for the next pandemic in terms of what do we need to focus on? What are the real priorities here? Um, I think the someone mentioned a moment ago, the IHR, that was, I think, Catherine talking about that in the, in the break video. And I think what we've seen here, unfortunately, um, is the breakdown, almost complete breakdown in our region of states being willing to immediately share information about um, about the caseloads. Less so in places like uh, Korea and um, Japan, although in both countries we still have reporting problems. But certainly when we look at the Southeast Asian responses, um, there are a lot of, lot of obscurities that shouldn't have been there. Um, when Catherine and I were traveling in Southeast Asia for a project on AMR research a few years back, we were talking with people from different health ministries and from different health bodies. And even back then, um, on the question of sick animals being reported uh, in, in wet markets, there was a lot of resistance from local officials for that to happen, despite the IHR. So this weakening of that spirit was already in place. And I think COVID has really shown that if that states can either panic or strategically choose um, not to share that information, which I think is quite unfortunate. So we need to go back and really strengthen those regulations to make it a must. Um, the third point I would say is when we look at the region, moving away from Northeast Asia, perhaps more into Southeast Asia, is the competing priorities within a, within a pandemic. It's not just about health. Um, I do think that economic security and social cultural security, both of which then would feed into political stability, um, but in and of themselves, are for many countries in the region more important than dealing with the health issue. Um, that development agenda in Southeast Asia, I think, is still very strong, both in terms of social location, but also in terms of policy practice. There is a real need in many of these countries simply to get their economies up and going. And if that leads to a spike in cases, then that's a secondary issue. The primary issue is the economy. Um, and so we see countries trying to reopen before they've really got a proper hold on the, the outbreak. And I guess the last point is to just to suggest that what is now an old idea, but is perhaps newer than other old ideas, um, the issue of One Health um, and where we have to look at animal health, human health, environmental health together. Um, I think one of the weaknesses we've seen in our region is a prioritising on public health uh, within the pandemic. And obviously, I mean, there's a there's a logical reason for that and when to sort of safeguard humans. But when we do see flare-ups, it's because of sometimes crossovers with animals where they haven't been, uh, the animal reservoir of the disease hasn't been paid proper attention to, environmental problems spiking in terms of perhaps air pollution. But also within that usual trinity, I do think we have to add in social practices, cultural practices, um, whether it's Donald Trump recommending uh, bleach as an issue, whether it's people from different cultures saying they can't, a different belief system saying they can't 
take the vaccine. Um, we need to start to appreciate the role that culture plays in this, resistance to the vaccine as well, protests against the vaccine, unwillingness to socially distance and physically distance. So it's not just about the Trinity, which I do think needs to be restored, animal, human and environmental health, but it's also about appreciating the role that societies so, um, and cultural systems and practices of belief play in either mitigating the virus um, and the impact of the pandemic or in terms of allowing it to flourish. So those are just four areas I'd flag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nick. Much appreciated. Uh, Remco, would I be able to ask you please to, to try presenting now? Yes. Does it work now? Okay. That's great. Good that you hear me. Um, I uh, presented some slides, but I decided not to show them giving, uh, giving time and just to go into your question that, uh, that was asked. I think that's, uh, that's a better approach. So my, um, my, um, my entry point to this is, is that I've uh, worked for several years in Indonesia. So I look really from the more Southeast Asian Indonesian perspective on what is needed uh, uh, the coming time ahead. Um, and um, so I also, as I have family in Indonesia, I, I, I spent there quite regularly to, um, um, uh, and, and in that regard, also work with uh, university actors there and see how they uh, uh, position themselves in uh, upcoming challenges. Now, I had three things that I would like to that I would like to share. First is the COVID-19 impact in Indonesia, which I think is was was managed rather differently from other Asian states, in the sense that an archipelago of 250 million people. It's quite difficult to manage a health system so that it reacts appropriately. So it was quite chaotic. And I was there, there during the height of the pandemic last July, in lockdown, had to be in quarantine, um, and saw that the health system was simply overwhelmed. There was not enough resources, lack of oxygen, etc. And it was, and two things were very, um, were very, you saw that very upfront. First is was that people had to organize themselves outside the health system to deal with uh, funerals, etc., to try to acquire uh, oxygen. A lot of uh, volunteers were applied to help with burials, huh? which were very important in relation to uh, uh, Muslim wreaths. Um, so that was, that, was, that was very visible. The second visibility was the role of security actors, which were quite uh, broadly, because of the relative underinvestment in the health system, they needed to rely on the police and the military to provide uh, vaccines, to secure uh, testing stations, to secure also hospitals, etc. So these, uh, they have become much more visible uh, in, uh, in daily life than it was before COVID-19. This is traditionally not so strange because the military has acquired a, a prominent role in Indonesia public life, historic uh, and also in, uh, in in working with primary healthcare centers, that, but it somehow re-emerged. Uh, let me say it like that, in um, in the pandemic. So the second point from there is that over the years, Indonesia has learned to position itself more carefully in uh, in in global health diplomatic needs, especially after the um, let's say the issue of avian influenza outbreak in the region in 2006 2007 where where they when it when they were basically on the position that sharing uh, sharing pathogens would also with the rest of the world because they had the, uh, the 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 pathogenic sequence of the of the genome of avian influenza because it was circulating but they were of the position that they if they would share that pathogen with the rest of the world, they ought to have also access to vaccine development and countermeasures. So they were very active in what later become the pandemic influenza preparedness framework from WHO, and which is also a, a, a cru crucial feature from the Nagoya, the Nagoya protocol on um, 
on biodiversity. So the, 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 the emergence of their position and, and that they have a, and that they need to play actively also in the international level is somehow very visible now as well, because access to countermeasures and vaccine development is very crucial now also with, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So as it is a key country in the region, and as it has, I mean, it has relations, it's, it's very geostrategically oriented between Australia, India, China, and the Pacific, and hence the US. It needs to mm, position and meet uh, itself vis-a-vis -vis all those uh, all those actors. Um, and you see that very clearly also in how also vaccines were being uh, acquired uh, and, uh, and and the rollout there. It was very chaotic. The majority of the the vaccines in Indonesia available are from China. It's the, the Sinovac vaccines. There were bilateral agreements there, um, and. Um, Biopharma, um, Bio which is one of the big uh, pharmaceutical producers in Bandung, Indonesia, is producing for Sinovac uh, vaccines for the Southeast, Southeast Asian market. And at the same time, uh, WHO now is working on um, working with mRNA vaccine hubs around the globe to have more regional production. And Indonesia is also one of the, the countries there that's becoming quite quite, uh, quite visible through this uh, manufacturing capacity that they have. And so that also the big Western mRNA vaccine producers, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, etc., they now, together with WHO, are working quite actively with, with Indonesia and its diplomats to, to, get it, to get this running. Now, the specific thing about Indonesia and where they have a place in the in the global vaccine market and one of our PhD students is uh, is working on this is that because it's the because they see themselves developing vaccines for the Muslim world that those vaccines have to be halal they have to be made according to Islamic um, regulations and need to be approved by by Islamic ulama so there's a big belief in um, the vaccines being pure uh, and Indonesia not only for vaccines but tries to position itself as a as a global market for halal products and this is where they very actively now um, try to ensure that everything that they produce is according to these halal standards and working quite closely together as well with uh, um, with, with 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 Muslim uh, communities on this so what this exactly entails and what, what is evidence-based and not, that's a very interesting uh, academic also exercise, I would say. Uh, lastly, what, so in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this complexity, what needs to be done? And this is, this is more the, on, on the global picture. There's this whole debate about who owns the intellectual property of, uh, of, of, of vaccines and of for instance, the mRNA vaccines, they will not only be used for COVID-19, but will be more broadly used for other diseases. They're very valuable. And so there's a very active discussion in Geneva around uh, the intellectual property rights and, and, and the, the, the regulations there, as well as, uh, as WHO position into it and ensuring uh, uh, access. Uh, Europe and the US um, are of the position that uh, intellectual property rights need somehow to be maintained, but a larger number also of, uh, of Asian countries, not all of them are uh, willing to come to a kind of a waiver, a temporary waiver of intellectual property rights as to ensuring that they're available for the public good. So this is a very contentious debate, but I see that then from the Indonesian perspective that Asian countries are quite have stepped up also at this global level there um, uh, let's say they're uh, they're very actively also moderating and uh, and taking the lead in, in diplomatic discussions there and that's relatively that has emerged over the last uh, years so to say over
Thank you for that presentation. And thank you all three speakers for being so good at keeping to your time. I really do appreciate it. So we now have the opportunity for those who have been listening to these three speakers to come in with their questions and please feel free to do so. While we're waiting for the questions to appear, I'd actually like to ask each of our three speakers to uh, answer the question about the role of the World Health uh, Jerome talked about leadership and Nick talked about the future of the international health regulations. And then Remco was also talking about, you know, the, the, the current debates within Geneva around a uh, waiver on intellectual property. And we also, of course, have Indonesia right now playing an important role with the working group discussing health preparedness and whether we're going to have a treaty or revision to IHR or both. So I would just appreciate each of you to sort of talk about where do you see the role of the World Health Organization right now, specific to the region, but more broadly, if you like as well. Jerome, would I be able to ask you to go first, please? Sure. Um, thanks. And that's a great question. Um, you know, the World Health Organization, at least as it comes as far as COVAX and all the other activities, has been really critical as an organizer. And you know, from its perspective as an international organization, as a normative organization that sets policy and does training, the World Health Organization is actually in a really important position uh, with regard to helping to set the rules uh, or making recommendations anyway, getting the vaccines um, qualified or actually approved through a mechanism that isn't only the national regulatory authority of, of an individual country, particularly important for those countries whose regulatory authorities are not considered stringent or, or maturity level four, the highest level, like the US FDA or the EMA. Or the, um, and, and so the WHO has a very important role. Um, I think that the important question is, you know, does the, is the WHO structured to be the group that is looking at the big picture? Uh, if they were given the authority, could they use it? And then are they structured to be able to receive significant funding and then use it in a manner that would allow vaccines to be for health system, systems to be strengthened for vaccines to be distributed for impact to be measured you know are they the group that is capable of doing that and and i don't know the answer to that i think to some extent the failure of leadership is a failure of countries i mean we've all gone each our separate ways and you know some big countries have that would normally be global health leaders have kind of wandered off and, and no one's really getting together and saying, look, we need to come up with a plan. We need to make an either a new organization or strengthen an existing organization to be able to take responsibility. You think that there's not enough money in uh, COVAX, um, Gabby, then we're going to give you the authority to borrow money from the World Bank as much as you need to make your contracts as quickly as possible, because we need to get, you promised that you would give 2 billion doses and right now you've shipped 500 billion. So, I mean, there are all these elements that aren't exactly fitting together and what you really need is some something, someone, some organization that will pull it along. I mean, if you had to put your finger on the lead, would you be able to? And in a global pandemic where, you know, so many people have, when 5 million people have died, maybe 15 million, according to the latest um, guess, uh, best guesses, are we really responding like this is a global crisis? Um, and, and I and and that's the challenge. Um, and I'm not sure. I think WHO clearly has a very important role to play, no matter what. Um, they're, you know, they have antagonized some people, which is always going to happen. Um, they've come back and they've come up with some really important um, uh, guidelines around the use of vaccines around advocating for you know, not doing additional significant booster vaccinations until more of the world is vaccinated. They've advocated for you know, um, vaccines being given to countries that are low income, but the problems persist. And so, you know, and to, to some extent, I think it may be the structure of the, the WHO. Um, and if they were given, and no one's given them the authority or the ability to do this. And, and the question is, you know, would they have would they have been more of a driving force had, say, the United States, the UK, the, the EU, stood behind them and said, 
we want you to do this. You know, the question who's in charge, the answer should be WHO is in charge and, and we don't have that consensus. And I'm not sure that they asked for it or that anyone did. Thank you. That's a really interesting response. Um, we have now got a lot of questions uh, coming in, which is fantastic. Uh, would I be able to actually ask those of you who maybe want to address Remco and Nick, if you want to address that your question later on, if we run out of questions, you can come back to it, but I'd really like to get our audience questions if that's okay. So sorry, uh, Jerome, I have another question for you. Uh, and then I have one for Remco, but uh, Jerome first, uh, to what extent can we live with the virus when the global vaccination rate is still relatively low? So that's an interesting question. And if you'd asked me last year, I would have said, well, maybe if we could vaccinate people fast enough and we continue to use the distancing um, and, and masks that we know um, also prevent transmission, that maybe we might be in a position to say certain countries without lockdowns and, and you know um, zero tolerance policies have been able to really control uh, the pandemic. I think now more than now, based on what we know about the vaccines, we, we see that the vaccines actually don't actually prevent transmission. They, they do decrease it probably to some extent, less so for some variants than for others. We also know that that when countries have you know, assume that they were okay because 70% of the population had received at least one vaccine, that they've had massive explosive outbreaks in unvaccinated populations because in many of those countries, vaccinations were not systematic. There were large groups of people, say, let's just take the United States since I'm an American. East Coast and West Coast were 80%. The center was 20%. And you know, when you do the modeling, the presence of that large group of unvaccinated individuals, not dispersed throughout a population, but all concentrated in one area, is exactly what uh, will fuel further outbreaks. And that's exactly what happened. You needed a Delta variant that was more transmissible, a large number of unvaccinated people all in the same place, all not using the things that we know protect you and not taking the vaccine. And we, you know, and we, we know Outbreaks cause variants, variants cause outbreaks. And until you break that cycle, we're going to continue, we're going to live with it. And that means that, you know, we're going to have to take what we know, which is that the vaccines protect against severe infection, hospitalization, and death. And we're going to have to figure out how to prevent transmission. And we're going to have to figure out whether or not we need booster doses, or if we can use, you know, smaller doses, what we call fractional doses. If it's better if the vaccines are, if you get a booster dose, which is the same vaccine or a booster dose, which is a different vaccine, what is the optimal interval? So, you know, we watch these uh, protective titers drop over time. And, and some countries have used that as justification for additional booster doses. But in fact, is it really affecting severe infection, hospitalization and death? And what are the markers of that? You know, and, and we still are trying to develop all the science around this. And I have to say, I mean, no, no country has the book. You know, the, this is what works. Uh, and we don't. And so every country has taken an empirical approach. The thing is that about these empirical approaches is that they should be shaped by data. I think those of us who have a scientific background think, yes, OK, uh, loosen up a bit. Let's find out where the outbreaks are occurring, what works, what doesn't work maybe shift backwards a bit or you know go back into a much more protective mode figure out what went wrong and then and then because the ultimate goal is to protect people and if the vaccine will do that and and there's really good evidence that they do 11 fold reduction in deaths and hospitalizations among vaccinated Americans compared to unvaccinated vaccines work they're doing what they're supposed to do but there are going to be infections how do we minimize that we find better ways to prevent transmission. We combine vaccines with other approaches. You know, when we talk, I'm, I come from HIV vaccines. We never talk about the vaccine being the only solution. We talk about vaccines being a part of a comprehensive solution that includes pre-exposure prophylaxis, you know, post-exposure prophylaxis, um, circumcision, 
condoms, uh, you know, we, we talk about a solution that is based on everything we know that prevents HIV transmission. Well, you know, with COVID, we should take the same approach. And that means that governments, I mean, people who advocate for vaccines are going to have to learn to, to deal with the questions and to communicate clearly about uh, what is happening, why it's happening, and what to expect. Thank you for that. And sorry for my brief departure. We have a, due to climate change, we have a timer on our lights at my university. So uh, it's often quite awkward for, for webinars. Um, I have a question now for Remco. Uh, although documented migrant workers have access to vaccines in Taiwan, the coverage has been low because of vaccine hesitancy. I think it's important to think about the influence of culture and religion. Could you offer suggestions to improve vaccination coverage for Indonesian migrants or migrants in general? Yes, it's, uh, it's an important question that has to do with vaccine hesitancy, which, uh, and there are several aspects to this. In general, and our institute is working also on vaccine hesitancy across different uh, regions. Uh, it has to do with trust and confidence that uh, if you take a vaccine, that it's also leading to individual well-being, but that you're also being secured in a broader sense, that it doesn't have any repercussions. So I would link the individual more health security part to the more human security part, huh? uh, especially with undocumented migrants, for instance. I mean, that their registration at the, at would not lead to them um, yeah, having been... Uh, um, let's say having problems with the authorities later and then that, it, that it's or that any coverage is also being uh, uh, let's say be properly covered by insurance etc um, there is some from indonesia there is some worries about the effectiveness of the covid uh, of the sinovac vaccine especially because it seems it uh, it, it uh, uh, during the pandemic there there was uh, questions about uh, it, it came out that there was only about 50% efficiency, et cetera. And we saw people being uh, infected that had uh, double doses of the vaccine. And then people didn't want to take, they, they needed to have an additional doses. And was that then um, an mRNA vaccine or not? And here communication matters. So I would say that you need to have a kind of a liaison person between the migrant community and the authorities that explains uh, that and i found it I, it was rather chaotic in uh, in, uh, in indonesia how all the information was shared etc uh, and i think it clear it's it's a communication strategy but thinking about governance and, and government in, in general and that if you work with the migrant community that you need to provide them a decent form of protection security in general as also to improve their let's say acceptance of a, of a medical product like a, like a vaccine thank you and i have another question for you if that's okay and don't worry our other two guest speakers are going to be coming back to you soon as well with more questions uh remco uh although the documented migrant uh, sorry if this one the next one sorry um i'm getting i think i've gotten my questions confused here now sorry about this sorry i'm going to go that was the same question. Sorry about that, Remco, but you're off the hook for a moment. Okay, no problem. <laughs> type try, sorry. Uh, Dr. Kim, may I please ask you now a question about the World Bank? Uh, and this one has a particular view, I think. Uh, this is their words, not mine. Um, how can the World Bank, with its dogmatic imposition of structural adjustments, contrasted with the relatively conditionless vaccination aid of China or Cuba, continue to be a relevant stakeholder in global health policy? So, um, very important question. And, you know, I think that one of the things that we have to be careful about is that, you know, is to focus on the global mechanism for um, acquiring and distributing vaccine. The, despite the generosity of individual countries, um, you know, a systematic solution providing all countries that were a part of the COVAX mechanism. So that's about 191 or 192 countries 
with enough vaccine to vaccinate those populations at greatest risk. So, you know, roughly 20% of their need, that would be about 2 billion doses of vaccine around the world, um, should be a, a clear priority. Individual political decisions that are motivating um, what some people have called vaccine diplomacy, other people have called vaccine nationalism, but it's really um, the use of vaccines being distributed to your friends and, and not being given to people who you might not consider to be necessary or friendly towards your country is really not the best way to approach a global pandemic. I mean, and, and this sounds a little bit Pollyanna-like, but in fact, you know, there is significant evidence that, that would suggest that we need to protect those populations, which if infected, have the highest mortality rate. And those populations are the same around the world. So I think that the generosity of, of Cuba and China, I mean, the gifts of the United States or the, or the United Kingdom to specific countries around the world are all important because all the countries need vaccine. But there is also a global mechanism. And the global mechanism was designed for a specific reason. And it's far short of what it needs to have in order to be able to uh, vaccinate the people at greatest risk. So I think that Okay, yes, the World Bank has restrictions and requires a, a number of structural, um, has a number of structural requirements around these um, questions, and, but they weren't the only ones offering money. You know, the regional development banks were offering uh, funding also, or had funding available. I mean, different organizations had funding available. Again, the, the question is, what did we really, what do we really need? And what do countries really need? And it, you know, is it possible that a that we can put those 2 billion doses from all the excess doses that the high income countries have purchased, make those 2 billion doses available to COVAX so that the people at greatest need around the world can be vaccinated. And then, you know, the estimate is by next year, maybe there'll be between 20 and 30 billion doses manufactured in 2022, which is what we need. Um, but we need to protect the people who are most vulnerable now. And um, so I, I, I think that Maybe I didn't answer the question, but I'm, I, I think I'm trying to focus on the idea that we need to suspend our, our national um, programs and really focus on, on what we as a global society need in order to protect the most vulnerable. I think you answered the question. It was a great question. It was a great response. Thank you. Uh, Nick, may I please ask you a question now from one of our uh, wonderful audience members. There is currently a wave of public health measures that excludes non-vaccinated people from shops, restaurants and other places. This has sparked debate on the level of government intervention that we want in our private spheres. Can we build policies that include vaccine hesitant people without excluding them from society? to the extent that we have seen, for example, they, the audience member mentions in China. And it's a debate we're all having at the moment. Yeah. Um, I think if we had another panel, perhaps another conference, this could be answered or probably partly addressed. Um, I guess, gosh, part of my hesitancy is, um, let me see how I can answer this one. I think that there's, I think the frame is wrong for the question. Um, I think that there, first of all, I think there's an obligation, and I guess I'm going to reveal my own cards here. I think there's an obligation on people um, to get over their hesitancy um, in order to provide greater safeguards at a societal level. The social contract um, irrespective of if it's an authoritarian social contract or a Lockean social contract, is between the individual and the state. But in both cases, it's lensed through societies. Um, and so I think there is a responsibility to society. And the more people who are vaccinated, the greater that protection that is given to the society. So I completely understand. Um, I have a colleague with whom I've had very robust debates in my own department about the if they should be vaccinated or not. Um, I completely understand hesitancy. Um, and I completely understand that some people, there are very valid medical reasons why that can't go ahead. Um, but with other, just as with other vaccinations that are out there, and we see this with the MMR vaccine, 
um, where there is hesitancy on that because of misinformation and a poor understanding of science. I think there needs to be a communication with those people, which I don't think any government has really done a good job on um, in terms of saying, look, yes, you might be hesitant. Um, and when we talk to people, these are the reasons why people are hesitant. Well, let's have a conversation about that. And I think throughout the entire process, um, with the possible exception of the Taiwanese government um, and to a lesser extent, the Singaporeans, I don't think any government in our region has done a good job in terms of communicating the strategies um, that they're undertaking and that they will then need to undertake later on. And I think that's an essential part. I think, uh, was it Remco or, or, or Professor Kim mentioned a moment ago, the need to communicate. I think the health communication aspect here is critical. Um, equally, I think the other point about the, the difference in the frame is that you have to appreciate, I guess, that these restaurant owners, these gym owners, these small cafe owners, they face increased costs and their economic situation is much more precarious during COVID. And if there is an outbreak in their shop because someone who was unvaccinated brought the virus in, that has significant impact on the economic security and well-being of those people and also their families. Um, and so in that respect, I do see a very rational argument for saying only vaccinated people can be in places where there is public gathering, for example, because it's for those smaller owners that you have to have a degree of protection as well. Because if that group of economic actors collapses, then there are massive ripple effects out through the economies, whether they're capitalist economies or the more planned economies. And so I think there is a, I think that issue of communication is probably the biggest issue here. Um, and I think this isn't just a COVID issue, though. Uh, this this goes back, you know, into basically every other disease we faced, we still face, and we faced before COVID. Uh, we have childhood vaccination programs, but there is resistance to some of them, and increasingly so in some countries. There is that lack of the state saying, this is what we have to do, and allowing science to lead the process forward um, so that people can understand the necessity of it. That was a bit stuttery at the start, but I think I got there towards the end. Um, if I could just add one more thing to um, to the question that was to Remco, um, with tapping into the migrant worker communities and increasing trust, um, the Australian government uh, for a long time uh, was running health, uh, health programs in both Xinjiang and also in Tibet, engaging with uh, local religious leaders. And we've seen this replicated in other countries in Southeast Asia, not by the Australian government, but by other governments, where you use trusted social leaders. And again, it's a communication thing. You bring them in and you get them to be an advocate for um, the vaccine process or that whatever the health process is underway. And then because of their position, their trusted position within society, if they do accept that, then people are more likely to follow the message. Um, I'm not saying they should always follow the message, but I'm saying at least there's that communication from a trusted social actor because frequently find that government actors in whatever country we're in these days um, are less trusted than societal actors and maybe doctors and nurses. I think we're running up for time at the moment, but I really would like to make sure, though, that before we close, if there is anything else that our speakers would like to add uh, before we come to a close for this panel, I really would value your maybe one, two minute interjection. Yes, thank you, Remco. And I, um, this is really me, my. Me speaking as a public health professional, we should not forget that vaccines is only one among the many public health interventions that we can take to improve public health outcomes. There are long proven public health measures to ensure that infectious diseases cannot spread. And we should really think more about the upstream determinants of health that leads to these epidemics in the first place. And that's really about how we produce and consume and how we organize our economies. And that uh, we, we should not forget that lens next to the important matter of uh, vaccine rollout and, and distribution. Mm. 
Thank you. Yes, Dr. Yes, Dr. Kim. To build on um, what Nick had said, which is, you know, we may have started uh, incorrectly. I mean, we started the, the talk about masks and everyone assumed that the mask was to protect you. In fact, the data are much stronger that the mask is protecting the people around you. And as we think about, um, you know, the use of these vaccine passports and, and, and other things to get into bars or restaurants or gyms, karaoke places, um, really, you know, vaccination is about protecting you, but it's also about protecting the people around you. And as we think about transmission now and the ongoing transmission, despite vaccination, we really ought to be thinking not only about, you know, the individual, but about the people around you. So, you know, it isn't only about us, uh, the individual, it's about the people around you. And the masks and the vaccines are helping us to control the spread to people around you. It's very similar, in, in, at least in my mind, to what you know we do with, with smoking. I mean, when I grew up, it was perfectly acceptable to smoke in an airplane or to smoke in a hotel. Now we force everybody to go outside. Why? Because secondhand smoke kills 40,000 Americans a year. Well, 750,000 Americans died because we couldn't get people to wear masks and distance. And now we can't get them to take vaccines. You know, this, this is about protection. And we have lots of laws that protect, I mean, seatbelt laws. And we have these laws that are important. And, you know, when I, when my parents first, and I remember my parents first driving us around, we never use seatbelts. We always do now. So there are things, there are things that we should have communicated better in the beginning. Um, and, and they're coming back to haunt us. And we still aren't, as Nick says, aren't able to put together the kind of compelling argument and communication about why we're doing what we're doing in a way that, that reaches people. I was having a conversation last week or two weeks ago in Germany with somebody who's working on the length of messaging. And it turns out that the generation that uses iPhones a lot, the length of messaging is one minute. Shorter the better, but one minute. And none of our messages are. So again, I think there's a lot that we could learn about how to make it better. Um, thanks. Wow, one minute, that's phenomenal. Uh, it's a, I, I have my poor students. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would really love to uh, thank all of you for just a fantastic panel. I think the takeaways that I'm hearing from this is leadership, communication, and the macro determinants of health, uh, as well as some other really important comments here as well about the need to think about us and not just us individually. Um, and I really do value all of your time and your contribution and your effort to, to attend this, this webinar. And, uh, and I wish you all the best with your really important work that each of you are individually doing uh, for the collective whole. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, welcome back. Thank you everyone for the excellent, excellent talks. Um, I wanna ask everyone in the audience to fill in the feedback forms before I forget. You would be doing us a great service and we would really appreciate it if you could take a few moments to fill in this very, very, very short, short survey. Um, you can find it by pressing the survey button at the side of the virtual attendee hub and we will also email it to you afterwards. Um, next up, we have our final speaker who is actually on sabbatical, but you know, academics have no natural sense of personal time. So we invited her anyway, and she graciously accepted. Dr. Crystal Ennis is a global political economy scholar, a university lecturer at Latin University, and is vice president of the Association for Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Studies. She's currently in Berlin as visiting research fellow at the Leibniz Centrum Moderner Orient, or ZMO, um, and in her work, she focuses on global migration, governance, and healthcare migration between South, Southeast, and West Asia, among other topics. She has a book coming out soon titled The South Asia, um, the South Asia to Gulf Migration Governance Complex. Um, she has also published her work in peer-reviewed journals such as The New Political Economy, Global Social Policy, 
Third World Quarterly, International Journal of Middle East Studies, and the Cambridge Review of International Affairs. Uh, quite, quite impressive. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with her at the Latin Asia Center when she's back in the Netherlands. And with that, I want to give the floor to uh, Dr. Ennis. Hello. Hello, thank you, Anoma, for this very kind um, introduction. And thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to hear from the distinguished speakers before me and to be able to share some thoughts uh, on the talks today and on the work in the book um, that come out of uh, my research on labor and migration governance in South and West Asia that you referred to. Um, so the book that's being launched today, I think, is coming out at a at a key time. While the crisis is ongoing, sufficient time has passed for us to begin to evaluate and compare responses, vulnerabilities, and opportunities. And the pandemic has set in front of us this entanglement of global health and labor mobility. And, and the volume uh, that we're discussing today has well explored this entanglement in the context of East and Southeast Asia. And my closing remarks today will address the pandemic and migrant workers on the move and discuss these in comparative and global perspective. And I'll make three points. The first is that labor exploitation and the exploitation of migrant workers in particular is a widespread and global phenomenon. And it's not limited to a particular geography. We see um, important comparative points um, across the world. The second point is that temporary labor migration regimes are expanding globally. And then the third is that the crises tend to lead to securitization and politicization. And we've heard lots about that today. So states around the world combine security and scientific logics to suspend people's rights to, to determine what they consider to be best for their personal health, their well-being, their right to mobility, and how this interacted, especially in the space of migration and migrant workers, is interesting for us. So what I'll do is I'll start with a small story. So there's a prospective migrant worker. He's living in a small town and he was promised a good job, a private room as accommodation by a recruitment agency. Working abroad was the only way that he could secure a decent living for his family. And the promised salary and, and a private room sounded like a really good arrangement. But when he arrived at his destination in early 2020, he found that he was sharing a room with four others in a small house with 21 migrant workers. And they had to share a bathroom, a fridge, and a single kitchen stove with only two working burners. And when he and his new colleagues arrived, they were met by a person in a face mask and full PPE, given a very small amount of money as a loan for necessities, and told to quarantine for 14 days with no further information. A week later, someone else arrived and made them sign a document they didn't understand. And then after two weeks of quarantine, work began, but they weren't given any protective equipment. And the only instructions they received were to wash their hands regularly and stay away from each other. And within three weeks, three migrant workers in the area had died of COVID and hundreds had fallen ill. I think this story might be familiar to many of us. Early in the pandemic, we heard a lot about migrant workers living in cramped quarters, contracting the virus, and also about migrant workers being stranded on their way to the country of work or stranded in a country of destination as the economy shrank and jobs dried up, no salaries and no way to be repatriated home. And as pandemic fears spread like dominoes, abruptly changing governance measures in country after country, we've seen both the stratification of class and race and also the fragmentation of the global governance response. We have seen borders close, but also remain open to certain classes or to certain sectors. And the public started to learn what work was really essential and that a great deal of this essential work was offered by migrants. And so borders had to open to facilitate their labor. The transformation and cur curtailment of labor, of mobility and travel during the pandemic has had immediate obvious ramifications and longer term consequences. We heard some, some examples today about Taiwan, Japan and the Philippines. The spread of the virus and the sharpening of borders left many migrant workers in legal, economic, health and social limbo. 
the pandemic exposed and heightened existing vulnerabilities in global migration and in global health, exposing the precarities and inequalities that characterize global labor regimes. So the first point, the geographies of exploitation. So stories like the one I opened with, they sound familiar to those of us who followed scandals around Qatar's winning the bid to host FIFA 2022 and shone a light, which shone a light on the conditions of migrant construction workers building the stadiums, or to those of us who followed the situation in Singapore but that and around the world. But that opening story didn't happen in, in West Asian locations, supposedly exceptional for their labor migration regime. The story happened in Canada, a story of a Mexican man going on a seasonal migrant agricultural worker visa to work in a rural community in Leamington, Ontario. Early in the pandemic, we heard st stories of Qatar's migrant workforce begging for food as jobs dried up and they were not paid their salaries. We heard of industrial areas and worker accommodations being locked down in Singapore and Dubai and Kuwait as as outbreaks among migrant workers living in close quarters spread. Migrant workers in Europe and North America pick our food. Border exemptions were made to reopen agricultural workers, uh, reopen to agricultural workers to ensure food supply um, and the supply of caregivers as well. Migrant workers in Singapore and Dubai build the cities and staff the service sector. Migrant workers around the world act as caregivers in our homes and care facility and in hospitals. Migrants are not only vulnerable to the virus, they're vulnerable to the healthcare regimes, vaccination regimes, border regimes, and immigration controls like we heard today that determine their legality and also they're vulnerable to the demand of consumption-driven, growth-driven, unequal world. The second point is about the expansion of migration. According to the ILO, which we also heard from Mr. Nair earlier, there are around 258 million international migrants, and among those, 164 million are migrant workers. And the funds these migrants send home, the remittances, are significant. And in 2019, just before the pandemic, these flows exceeded foreign direct investment and foreign aid. According to the IOM, labor migrants account for almost 30% of workers in some of the most affected sectors in the OECD, and they generate enormous amounts of, inter, uh, of remittances, um, uh, which continued to, to increase up until the beginning of the pandemic and the effect of which we'll see later. Among workers on the move, it's forms of temporary migration that are expanding the most rapidly. And we heard a lot of examples of that today. Under temporary migration regimes, migrants are allowed to labor, but they're not allowed to stay. And of labor migrants um, entering, for example, OECD countries in 2017, almost 600,000 held permanent visas but 4.9 million entered through temporary channels, with the latter group growing uh, twice as fast year on year. Guest worker programs are familiar to those of us sitting in Western Europe from the middle of the last century, and we came to know the adage, there's nothing temporary about temporary migration. And we see this experience, for example, in the story Mr. Nair told about his own family experience and his father spending his entire working life in the Middle East. We hear more about so-called temporary migration these days around the world as seasonal agricultural workers, construction workers, project-based workers, or as guest workers written about in the book uh, in the Taiwan chapter or in the kafala, the sponsorship system in Gulf economies. Why has this temporary migration resurged in popularity again? It's bolstered by this triple win migration and development discourse. The expansion of temporary migration schemes is based on a neoliberal economic logic where the migrant is tied to their economic productivity or contribution to labor markets. The triple win is assumed a win-win-win scenario for the sending country, the receiving country, and the migrant themselves. The receiving country for the cheap labor that boosts their productivity and growth, 
the sending country for its accrual of remittances and a lower social care burden, and the migrant for finding a higher income than available at home. But the logic of temporary migration is also meant to ensure the non-integrations of labor migrants in host societies on the one hand, and the durability of remittance transfers on the other. And as we saw and heard spoken about today, low wage, especially low wage labor migrants are frequently excluded or only partially incorporated into labor laws and welfare support schemes of host nations with minimal access to the full range of rights available to citizens. We saw two examples in the book, um, in the chapter on Malaysia by Kamaruddin and Idris. They show that on the one hand, Malaysia paid for the COVID-19 testing and the treatment of migrant workers. But at the same time, it declared that all those who would be in the country illegally would face deportation which like in other cases around the world, hinders the willingness of the undocumented to come forward, to seek treatment, to get vaccines, et cetera, um, for fear that their livelihoods would be impaired. Um, and second, in another chapter, um, uh, Liu shows that migrant workers on guest worker visas in Taiwan in practice lacked access to healthcare and financial support as well. Temporary migrant social legal status in countries of destination depend on the decisions of employers on low wage and low wage migrant workers are often forced into deferential labor relations and they're perceived to be outsiders with no right beyond the sphere of work and their presence in the country being tied to their work and this fear of potential disruption to this encourages all sorts of exploitive practices. And what we saw in the pandemic is it really hindered the global public health response in these categories. And this brings me to my third um, uh, argument about crises, hotspots, and discipline and control, which we were discussing at the very end of the last panel. So crises assign certain logics to geographies that are, can be designated as crisis hotspots, which is a term used by Palaskar Wilkins and also Zahra Babar. We saw this in the closure of borders, but also within borders and the designation of certain areas of cities as hotspots, like in Taiwan, as Dr. Lan spoke about today, in Malaysia in the book, and in Singapore, Qatar, Kuwait, among others, where labor dormitories and neighborhoods where migrants were housed were cordoned off. Singapore perhaps has an extreme case where the BBC has again recently reported that blue collar workers have known only the walls of their dormitories and their work sites since 2020. The measures imposed across these cases to address COVID cases and the spread of the virus, such as controlling and reinforcing the perimeters of labor camps, establishing special protocols for controlling migrants' inward and outward mobility, and deliberate strategies for screening and for sanitation, looked more like a deliberate means and or felt like a deliberate means to cordon off particular communities who are viewed as posing a threat to the rest of society. So in the post-pandemic era, might we continue to see that migrant workers find that their health continuously monitored and surveilled and that their right to mobility closely tied to their health status? Or are we going to continue to talk about this and think about ways forward other than that? Today's interesting event and the book being launched indicates the unprecedented crisis for migrant workers across Asia and the world caused by the pandemic responses that saw numerous countries close their borders. We can see both that the pandemic is a neoliberal crisis that can't be solved by a profit first, economy first solution. And second, that the vulnerability of our health and the resilience of our healthcare systems is determined by the level of protection, of access and care of every member of our societies. That is, if the most disadvantaged populations lack access to healthcare and lack basic human health and labor rights, we cannot solve the global health crisis. And in that sense, the, this pandemic has been quite classed and quite raced. Um, as Saori Shibata persuasively argues in her chapter on Japan in the book, um, but can also be said of other cases, the labor market, welfare provision, and public health are mutually dependent upon each other. Social inequality is a public health matter. And I would add to that in closing and say that labor 
labor mobility and labor rights are critically public health matters. And the logic of cutbacks, of reduced benefits and weakened labor protections are severely at fault for fanning the flames of the global pandemic. And I think this is an important shared global lesson that we can hope that policymakers and the industry take away. So thank you for listening to my uh, closing reflections on this. It's really been an honor to be here with you today. Thank you, Dr. Ennis, for that enlightening talk and, and reflection. Um, I want to thank all the speakers today for their great talks and taking the time out of their busy schedules to be here. Thank you to all the participants for the great questions and also, like the speakers, taking the time to be here during these hectic times. The video of today's symposium can be viewed from tomorrow in the attendee hub and will be uploaded to the YouTube channels of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the Leiden Asia Center. The book, Public Health in Asia During the COVID-19 Pandemic, will be published open source in February 2022, with my gratitude to the generosity of the Light in Asia Center for making this possible. I also want to thank everyone at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for their hard work in organizing this conference. Awesome job. I really look forward to our next cake dessert lunch, camouflaged as a work meeting. And lastly, the IFO Research Center for providing us with great authors whose chapters are now included in the aforementioned volume. So please look forward to that as well. Now, please make sure to fill in the feedback form and press like and oh wait, this is not YouTube. Thank you and hopefully to our till our next event.